Canadian national right. anthem this year. Just in case anything I comes up that I well, I feel like when some, on. But yeah, sometimes when they um, throw three questions, I who's that guy right here? Sorry, yeah. it's just we're coming over here to do our speaking then. If you want, if you yeah. I know because my mic just oh, that's it. That's not happening. Yeah. 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 Do it for a long time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some people are comfortable yeah. sitting, so you so have to sit to do it. So do what you're comfortable. Yeah. Well, I'll follow the lead of who I, I do either. You either. You, you're yeah. just as you've done this. <laughs> Happy to do whichever. So. And it's difficult to find. So if we're over there, then we got to have somebody run that slide. Oh, and they're changing. I mean, if you're... Can... 1030 now. Really? Well, Dave Parker? does. He'll set, well, the, he'll set the path. Yeah. I got my lot friends from the Seaway. Was there. Oh. Made it or not, so. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I thought they said that not everybody has. Yeah. 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 So I thought we were going to have to like yeah, shut that. That is a really fascinating. This is exactly yeah. the room yeah. that I was in for the other well, event. interesting because they <coughs> Wanda Coop, the Manitoba artist, Winnipeg artist. We have an exhibit for stuff on the fourth floor, and it's about going to the same point. Here? Yeah. yeah. One floor down. I've got to see that. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. I've probably seen so it at other times. Is that um, an <coughs> ambassador here? Yeah. 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 I feel, I feel like I should have got... We need to do a lunge and learn of like a slideshow of, of people's faces, faces you should know. Well, I did that. I did image search for people like... Oh, yeah. The guy in the pink salmon tie that's just walking in. Who just walked in? That's our panelist here tomorrow. Oh, okay. He missed, he missed the introductions. He, he walked in right at the end of the day. Yeah. Mining Institute pen that I got last year on my Canadian energy show. Like, what's this, like, face off here? Yeah. <laughs> it's a good, um, speed dating for nerds. Hockey, yeah. hockey analogy. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> I, I was trying to figure out an Alanis Morissette quote for each of my slides, yeah. but I, could, I, you could. I just failed. Like, I started <laughs> off, and, you know, I just kept coming back to, isn't that ironic? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, how are you? See you? Yeah, yeah. I'm Brian from MISO. I feel like we met maybe. Uh, we have definitely met Iowa when you walked in. Yes, yeah. I believe that's right. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, their initial right. power plant yeah. kick. I don't think Tim, yeah. Jan, indeed. Yeah. Wow, good memory. I normally try and forget everything that happens to me in <laughs> Iowa. In <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> Actually, uh, Des Moines is pretty. Pretty all right. There's a uh, this, this is this is getting granular right away. But there's a T-shirt shop in Des Moines, Iowa called Raygun that they have the like funniest, wittiest <laughs> stuff you'll ever see. Some of it you know, crosses the line, of course, but uh, like there is a there's a like three block radius where Raygun is that just its creativity blossoms. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle, yeah. Kyle, Derek. Yeah, Doug. Doug. Nice to meet you. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. They make the playoffs for the first time in, I don't know, like, well, there's a period there where they didn't exist, so yeah. that was a problem. But the first time in 20 years, and then they just crap the bed. Yeah. It's not good. Uh, I think they did win one game. Yeah. It's good that it's, it's not a sweep. It's I don't think so. Uh, the Anaheim Ducks. Oh, okay. You should tell um, Jane not to sit in the back and to come to all of this. But, well, we were uh, kind of surprised to see the Caps get a first round. Oh, it's great! Yeah, they're they normally the they're normally the heartbreakers of yeah. Uh, yeah. the Chicago Cubs of hockey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> no, I think that's going to be exciting. Ovechkin is such a fun player to watch. So, yeah. I was thinking that my one slide should be NRDC's new logo, which to me looks exactly like a hockey team. Kind of uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen We're the mighty NRDC. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Whatever happens on there. Yeah, I'm not worried about it. I guess it's I guess it's full. Right? It's half full of water. Well, it's full, it's just too big. Yeah. <laughs> I like that tide. Just uh it's good. Okay. I wanted to get uh, a tie like uh, Bill Libro has. Yeah, he's got a... Where is that guy? Uh, he's uh, out in the hall. He's out in the hall. He's got like a crazy fit. Uh, I'm told one floor down is uh, Manitoba Artist with all the art on the wall. Okay. I just wanted to have, uh, you know those pens that go like this and the thing closes. Yeah, right, right. So now you have a tie. And <laughs> It, it, it got a little bit better since I sent the message. Oh, no, he sent it to you. Either way, it's You know, when the market first opened, and uh, we uh, are you going to the? Um, we were investing in swag. I said, I'm gonna. The idea was we got to get one of those yeah, and somehow put a little propeller in there, like a turbine, or you could make your own hydro. That I like these uh, bright lights. Yeah, and they're like I. You just can light a little light at the end. Oh, he did. Specifically right? targeted at you. We just don't have the swag that we used to because okay. the bilateral market is, you know, kind of. It's <laughs> always a good going signal. Yeah. It's exposed. And you guys to transparency. And you guys don't take anything, so. <laughs> and our swag is pretty. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Could you please take your seats? Welcome to this morning's program, Canadian Hydropower and the Clean Power Plan. I'm David Viette, Director of the Canada Institute here at the Wilson Center. And for those of you who don't know, the Wilson Center is the United States Memorial to our 28th President, our only president with a PhD. And we try to shed light and dialogue on issues of public policy to try to get communities to work with each other, business community, academic community, policy communities. And within that, um, there's a Canada Institute, which I direct, and we look at mainly energy, energy and environment issues, trade and border and border security. So th this topic today really fits qu in, in there nicely. We have some signature publications that I put out. One is our One Issue, Two Voices, um, which looks at a policy issue from the American point of view and a Canadian point of view. This one I'm holding up is on uh, business travel between Canada and the United States, and some of you may have had this happen, traveling before, that you, you're supposed to get across quickly and you don't, and you get asked if you're going to go work in the United States or are you going to go work in Canada. Well, this looks at that. Our other publication that's a relatively new series is called I Didn't Know That. Um, it's a two-pager for policymakers because that's about the attention span people have these days. But we try to take an issue and give some infographics, but one of our recent ones is on hydropower. So it's timely. Take a look at this. It's on the web in PDF. Send it to your friends. Um, it's a good. It's very useful. Um, I don't have too much more to say today. Um, we will be webcast. Um, we will have take questions from the web via Twitter um, at Canada Institute or via email Canada at WilsonCenter.org. Um, and for those of you in the room. We do have an exhibit of art on the fourth floor by Winnipeg artist Wanda Koop. Uh, and it's about her, she took a trip to the St. Lawrence Seaway and it's her interpretation of that through photograph and print. And while I was at Manitoba Hydro last month um, in Winnipeg, um, Jane made sure that I didn't get on the bus before I saw the Wanda Koop in the lobby of Manitoba Hydro building, um, which was fascinating and nice to, to be able to tell Wanda that. So go down, it's on the fourth floor, it's, it's up there, it's not going to move. Um, today's moderator is Jeff Hopkins from the Center uh, for Climate and Energy Solutions, uh, C2ES. Um, Jeff told me to say nothing about him, so I won't. Um, 
So I'll just turn it over to him. Jeff will be moderator and we'll introduce the, the speakers and it's going to be in his hands after this. So over to you, Jeff. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you also for the Wilson Center of the Canada Institute for hosting uh, this event. Um, obviously, we think that uh, Canadian hydropower is very important, uh, especially as it relates to clean power plan and uh, how states might be affected by the availability of the renewable resource. So C2ES, like they often do, said we ought to write something about that. Um, and our first two speakers today, uh, Doug Vine and Kyle Ahrens, uh, were the ones who wrote uh, the brief that is uh, out front. I think we call this a, a report, Canadian Hydropower and the, and the Clean Power Plan. And uh, the, uh, the report is kind of divided into two sections. One is a technical section, which Doug will be speaking to, talking about hydropower uh, and how it fits into um, the U.S. electricity system, uh, some facts about uh, how much of it is imported, how much of it is produced, both in the U.S. as well as in Canada, and how this exchange works. Then uh, the second part of the report, which Kyle will be speaking to, is um, a section on policy, and that's where we really get into the options that EPA has uh, for treating uh, clean, uh, treating uh, hydropower in the in the clean power plan. EPA did take comment on the question of uh, what should EPA do in 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 terms of um, addressing or assessing uh, international renewable imports. So obviously, both from uh, from Canada and from Mexico, take and comment how should how should they uh, produce it. So they're going to lead off with a report, and um, we also have uh, an infographic uh, which is available. They're out front. Uh, they're also available on the C2ES website. Uh, so please pick up a copy of those. Um, after uh, uh, Doug and then Kyle speak. Uh, we're going to have David Cormie uh, follow. David is the division manager for power sales and operations for Manitoba Hydro. Obviously, the uh, the only one uh, here who's producing any of this hydropower uh, is going to is going to speak to it. Uh, followed by Dave McMillan, who's the executive vice president for Minnesota Power and the um, president of external affairs for their parent company, uh, Elite, um, and. Uh, uh, David and Dave will talk about a, a relationship between those two um, uh, uh, power producers and, and distributors and how they integrate uh, or, you know, the role that hydropower plays in their operations. Uh, after that, we're going to have uh, move into an additional focus on markets. Brian Roberic, who's the interregional director uh, for government and regulatory affairs for the mid-continent mm -hmm. Um, independent system, op uh, independent transmission system operator, uh, or MISO, uh, is is going to speak next. Followed by Derek Murrow, who's the director of federal energy policy for the um, Natural Resources Defense Council. So, um, unless there are clarifying questions of uh, technical nature at the end or, or during the presentation. Um, uh, for each of the speakers. We're going to hold questions until the end. We've allotted uh, sufficient time to take everybody's uh, uh, questions that are here, as well as um, uh, people who are listening online will be able to, to ask questions. We'll answer them as well. So uh, let's start off with Doug Vine, Senior Energy Fellow at C2ES. I do have slides, yes. This is the time you look into this, right? Right. Um, I assume they were. Uh, no, that's Kyle. That's a fine. That's Kyle's. That's Kyle's. Oh, that is you. We'll go back down. Probably that one. Yeah. It's PowerPoint. It's a PDF. Oh, was it PDF? It's a PDF. It's a PDF. I just need to make it full screen. 
Good morning. Thank, thanks, Jeff. Uh, this morning I'm going to talk about uh, hydropower technology, and this content, for the most part, is, is in the paper that, that Jeff introduced. Specifically, I'm going to talk about the types of hydropower. Go to the next slide. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the benefits of hydropower and its challenges. Uh, then I'm going to talk about hydropower in the context of the U.S. and Canadian electricity systems. And I'll, then I'll follow that by a discussion of forecasts for new hydropower. And lastly, I'll finish up with some of the cross-border electricity trade. So it's very difficult to generalize about hydropower because each project is, is very different in terms of its size and its particular surroundings, but here goes. There are three main types, conventional with reservoir storage, run of the river, and pump storage facilities. All three generally involve building a dam, though that's not always the case. Uh, for example, some small-scale hydro can make use of conduits, other structures or diversions rather than a dam. But typically, the powerhouse where the electricity is generated is located at the base of a dam. All types of hydro make use of the energy and flowing water to generate electricity. Conventional hydro with reservoir storage is probably the type that most people are familiar with. Here, a dam is constructed and a large reservoir is created upstream, like the one shown in this picture. Reservoir sizes can vary, uh, providing days, weeks, or even multiple years of storage. Run of the river hydro creates almost no upstream reservoir, and the facility operates in concert with the natural flow of the river. And finally, pump storage facilities are, have an upper and lower reservoir separated by the dam. During periods of low demand and power prices, water is pumped to the upper reservoir. And when demand peaks and prices are higher, the pump storage facility operates like a regular hydropower facility and generates electricity. Uh, notably, pump storage facilities use more power than they create. Next slide. Hydropower is a renewable source of energy it re as it relies on water, which is continually renewed through the, water si through the natural water cycle. It's a very flexible source of power. It doesn't need to warm up. Open an intake structure, water begins flowing, and power is being generated very quickly. Hydro facilities can be relied on to provide baseload power or peaking power. When a conventional facility is not being called on to generate electricity, water will continue to accumulate in its reservoir, and this can be used at a later time on an as-needed basis, effectively providing a source of energy storage to the electricity system. Perhaps the most important benefit, and why we're looking at this technology in particular as a solution to the climate issue, is that when, hydro, is that when a hydropower facility is performing its primary function of electricity generation, it's not creating any greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. Of course, no source of power is without its criticisms. And here is a list of hydropower's challenges. Whether it's a run of the river project or a conventional hydropower project, damming a river alters its natural flow regime and its temperature. And this means changes for a river's flora and fauna, particularly, particularly migratory fish. Reservoirs also cause issues. Uh, when reservoirs are created, they can lead to the displacement of local people, towns, infrastructure, productive agricultural lands, and hunting grounds. When trees, grasses, and other organic material are submerged by a reservoir, this leads to greenhouse gas emissions as the biomass breaks down, though this dissipates over time. Moreover, flooding a reservoir, uh, a reservoir flooding a forest or grassland area permanently alters a natural carbon sink. That said, hydropower operators, utilities, are working to mitigate these challenges. 
advances have been made in hydropower design which minimize flooding <clears throat> and their impact on river life. For example, programs are in place along the Columbia and Snake River in the U.S. Which, ma which maintain river flow throughout the year and also control the temperature throughout the year, or attempt to control the temperature in as much as they can. Additionally, in Canada in particular, uh, affected parties like First Nations are being con consulted early and throughout the hydropower development process. And notably, in both the U.S. and in Canada, new hydropower facilities or modifications of facilities of any size are subject to stringent environmental rules or reviews to ensure better environmental outcomes. These are the electricity generation statistics for 2013 for the U.S. and Canada. The United States generated more than 4,000 terawatt hours of electricity in 2013 and Canada more than 620. So the U.S. generated around 6.5 times the amount of electricity as Canada. The generation mixes of the two countries, as you can see, are very different. The U.S. relied on fossil fuels for just over two-thirds of its electricity. <clears throat> while fossil fuels make up only one-fifth of Canada's electricity mix in 2013. Hydropower is the dominant electricity source in Canada. In 2013, the U.S. had around 79,000 megawatts of hydropower capacity, and Canada had nearly 76,000 megawatts. In terms of zero emission electricity, hydropower represented around 20% of the United States' zero emission electricity and it was a little more than 80% of Canada's zero emission <coughs> electricity in 2013. Both countries have a vast technical potential for additional hydropower capacity. However, the Energy Information Administration in the U.S. expects that around 2,300 megawatts of hydro capacity will be added between now and 2040 under a business-as-usual scenario. Because other sources of generation are growing faster, uh, in 2040 hydropower is expected to generate about 1% less of U.S. electricity than it did in 2013. High upfront costs, regulations, and cheaper alternatives like natural gas combined cycles are among the reasons for the limited supply additions. Notably, the United, in the United States, only 3% of the nation's 80,000 dams currently generate power. Many dams are used for flood control, irrigation, recreation, navigation, or to create a reliable water source. So there is certainly a lot of potential to add power to these existing structures. <clears throat> In our paper, we also point to studies by Oak Ridge National Laboratory and others that discuss uh, the potential for new hydro in the U.S. Today, the U.S. has a little, a little more than 700 <coughs> megawatts under construction or near the construction phase, and around 4,400 megawatts or so that, has been, that have been announced or is provisional. Looking at Canada, <coughs> excuse me, the National Energy Board expects hydropower to remain the dominant source of electricity supply in Canada out to 2015, 2035, sorry, in its business as usual scenario. Around 8,000 megawatts of new capacity is, is expected to be added in the next 20 years. Currently in Canada, there's around 4,000 megawatts of hydropower either under construction or near the construction phase and reported 7,000 that's been announced or in an earlier stage of development. So lastly, I'm going to touch, touch on the U.S. and Canadian electricity trade. The two electricity systems are tightly integrated across the U.S. and Canada. There are currently around three dozen international connections. The two systems are highly complementary. Since demand peaks in each country during a different season, Canada in the winter and the U.S. in the summer. Quebec is the largest exporting province, followed by Ontario, Mon Manitoba, and British Columbia. In 2013, more than 60 terawatt hours of electricity was exported. The trade goes two ways but Canada is a net exporter. Around three quarters of these exports are traded short term on power <coughs> markets, the rest through firm power purchase agreements. 
New transmission lines and policy will likely lead to greater electricity trade between the two countries. Some of the new transmission, transmission lines being considered in the Northeast are the Champlain Hudson Power Express, which recently got approval from the Army Corps of Engineers, the Lake Erie Connector, and the Northern Pass. And in the Midwest, the Great Northern Transmission Line could be in operation by 2020. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kyle Ahrens. I'm a senior fellow at C2ES. If you'll <coughs> indulge me for a second, we're just going to load my presentation. <coughs> All right. All right, so hello again. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Clean Power Plan very briefly um, and talk about what it means when we ask the question, does hydropower count in the Clean Power Plan? Um, you kind of hear that a lot. There's concern that existing hydro doesn't count. Maybe Canadian hydropower doesn't count. What does that, what does that mean? Um, and then I'll go through some, uh, some different options that EPA has on how to count Canadian hydropower, if to count Canadian hydropower. Um, and then we'll talk about some concerns with that and some possible uh, impacts Canadian hydropower can have on the emission rates of some states. So the Clean Power Plan really has two fundamental elements. Uh, one, it sets a target emission rate for each state. Um, so each state has to meet certain emissions over generation. Um, and second, it establishes how states calculate their emission rate. Um, so that's up on the screen here. So you take your emissions from covered sources. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's just a direct measurement of how much carbon dioxide your power sector is emitting. Um, but then you divide that by qualifying generation. So the key issue is what's qualifying. Um, this is where we're probably going to see some change uh, between the proposal and the final. Um, one example is nuclear, another one could be uh, hydropower. Um, so as proposed, any new hydropower, at least domestically, uh, can count in this equation. Um, so if you build a new facility or if you have an upgrade at an existing facility, you can include that if you're a state in your emission rate. Um, but generation from existing power, again in the United States, um, is not going to be in this equation. And then the question is, in what's the situation in Canada. So another option to the, that rate-based approach is to take a mass approach. So states can just cross out generation and just directly measure their emissions, set a mass-based uh, cap on an annual basis. Um, so in that sense, the numerator of the equation doesn't, doesn't change. You're still just measuring your uh, emissions. But since you're not dividing that by generation, um, there really is no more concept of, of qualifying generation versus unqualifying generation. Anything that uh, reduces your emissions, so anything that is displacing fossil generation, um, is going to, to count in a sense. Um, but even if uh, hydropower or any other resource doesn't count, if you can't include it in the denominator of your emission rate, equation, it still is helpful. Um, it still can reduce your uh, emission rate. And so I'd like to walk you through a little example here. Um, and all of this is in our report, if anything is unclear. Um, so we're just going to assume a very, very simple power system. Um, imagine this is a whole state. You have three uh, fossil plants and one wind farm. So you're taking the emissions from your three uh, fossil plants, you're dividing that by the generation from the three fossil plants plus your wind farm. So at this point, your emission rate uh, is 1,500 pounds per megawatt hour. And then if you add to that unqualified hydro, so 
Imagine if you are having if you added new imports from Canada that for whatever reason EPA isn't allowing the state to count. Um, what happens? So if you imagine that new hydropower plant is uh, the same size as one of your fossil plants, so that a fossil plant is totally displaced, now you have the emissions from two, only two power plants in your numerator, but you have fewer megawatt hours in your denominator uh, since you have, you're not allowed to count the hydro in that denominator. Um, but your emission rate still goes down because you're displacing emissions. So the key here is when we're talking, you know, does Canadian hydropower count? In a sense, it's going to count regardless, um, but it can count more if it's, if it's qualified. So if EPA says you're allowed to count Canadian hydropower, that means you're adding it uh, to the denominator of your emissions equation and it goes down even further. Um, so just, again, really when, you know, throughout the report and for the rest of the presentation, the question is, does new hydropower in Canada, um, is that allowed to be in, in the denominator of your emission rate equation? And um, let's see. And so EPA kind of leaves this as an open question, um, or proposes it as an open question. So in the uh, supplemental proposal, which is the top quote here, you don't have to read all of it, the key is that EPA is just asking the question to stakeholders, what do you think of Canadian hydropower? They actually list Canadian hydropower um, specifically, uh, or at least Canadian generation specifically. Um, should this be a qualifying resource or not? Uh, EPA doesn't propose either way. EPA doesn't say it should or it shouldn't. They just leave it open. And then I just also wanted to call attention to the, the bottom quote, um, and this is from the, the Clean Power Plan proposal in, in June, not from the supplement, um, that suggests that EPA might um, only allow states to include renewable generation that's uh, generated within the state. So I think that implies that they are at least proposing an option that any imported renewables, be it from Canada or one state to another, uh, would not count as qualifying generation. So we're just going to kind of talk through uh, those options. Um, so, so what can EPA do? Uh, so one option is to treat Canadian renewables, including hydropower, as you would any other uh, interstate import. So that again would be if you're importing from an existing hydro project in Canada, it doesn't count. Uh, if you're importing from a new project, it does. Um, so this option seems to be uh, the most popular. Uh, we reviewed many sets of stakeholder comments from uh, states that import hydropower. Uh, we looked at comments from uh, environmental advocacy groups and from some power companies that we thought maybe would have uh, some concerns about imported hydropower. Uh, but across the board, this issue was either not mentioned in those comments or um, the comments spoke favorably about Canadian hydropower and why EPA should treat it the same as, as interstate hydropower. Uh, the second option, of course, is to not allow international hydropower to count at all. Again, no one was in favor of this option, at least of the comments we reviewed, um, but we wanted to address it since it seems to be on, uh, on the table for EPA. Um, and then one third option that may, may just be theoretical uh, is to allow some special consideration for new imports from existing projects. So if there were to be a, a hydro project in, in Canada that can't get, that can only get, send a limited amount of its power uh, to the United States due to transmission constraints, and a state works to alleviate those constraints with a new transmission project, allowing more imports to come in, um, we think EPA should at least explore this um, as calling it new hydropower rather than existing hydropower, since you really, that state would have needed to <coughs> take some effort um, make some investments in, in bringing in that hydropower. So some concerns that we uh, saw in, in, the, in the comments on this issue uh, are double counting. Um, so that means if the renewable quality of uh, a hydropower project is, is counted either by more than one state or by a province and a state, um, and that would, you know, overstate the, the positive impacts of, of hydropower. Um, 
EPA suggested in its uh, proposal, or at least I believe in the supplement, um, that they want to ensure that imported hydropower is displacing fossil generation and might consider only allowing it to count if it does displace fossils. So that's another uh, possible concern. And then third concern that we saw is of leakage. Um, so this would be the result of just kind of an accounting shift between the emission rates of uh, Canada and the United States without any actual change in uh, generation. So if you imagine a province currently generating some hydropower and some fossil, sending some fossil and some hydro into the United States, and due to the Clean Power Plan, um, the importing state says, we don't want any more fossil, just send us your hydro. Uh, the province says, okay, and they just, from simply an accounting perspective, say now we're sending more hydro into the United States, keeping more of the fossil for ourselves. That allows the state possibly to, uh, from an accounting perspective, again, reduce its emission rate, whereas the mix across the United States and Canada hasn't changed. Um, so that's another possible concern. Um, so for a variety of reasons, we think, you know, these are all legitimate concerns, but they are easily uh, overcome, maybe not easily overcome, overcome but um, can be overcome in a, in a straightforward way. Uh, so the double counting issue first. Uh, so this isn't unique to the international context. This is also an issue with uh, renewables, non-hydro-renewables, I should say, that flow across state lines. Uh, we already have a system set up to track uh, renewable energy certificates. Um, so you can decouple the actual electricity from hydro from its renewable uh, quality. So someone who's not actually consuming the electricity can, can take credit. Um, again, we already have a, a system for, for tracking that, um, the REC tracking system. I think you'll hear more about this in a, in a later presentation. But I just wanted to mention that it does include um, states as well as, as, well as provinces. Um, so we already have a system set up that, um, that would prevent double counting from, from occurring. Uh, and then the next concern is this uh, question of whether international hydropower is displacing uh, fossil generation. Um, it's, it's unclear, you know, it's kind of difficult to imagine why a state would want to use imported hydropower to displace something other than uh, fossil generation if its goal is uh, compliance with the Clean Power Plan. Um, it's not going to displace renewable energy or, or nuclear because that wouldn't be of any help for its uh, emission rate. Um, and we also think that if it's, you know, if it's not displacing fossil or if it's not displacing the need for new fossil anyway, um, the <coughs> accounting that the state would have to do would kind of m make it all work out anyway. I mean, as long as a state is accurately accounting for all of its emissions and all of its uh, generation, it's calculated emission rate will be an accurate picture. Um, so we're not, not quite sure why, um, why this requirement would be in place. Uh, and I also want to note that this requirement wasn't suggested in, in the interstate context. So if Minnesota is importing wind power from um, South Dakota, it doesn't have to uh, show that that's displacing fossil generation for it to be able to count um, where you don't think this situation should necessarily be different in uh, the international context. Uh, and finally, leakage. Um, so again, this is the issue of perhaps Canada, Canadian provinces generating relatively more fossil generation, sending relatively more hydro to the United States. Um, we think in many scenarios this is uh, unlikely um, for uh, three major reasons. There's federal Canadian policy, uh, there's provincial policy, and then there's the resource mix of the uh, provinces that do most of the exporting. Uh, so in terms of, of federal policy, uh, the uh, biggest, biggest impediment, I guess, to leakage is the fact that uh, coal generation, or at least new coal plants, uh, really aren't an option in, in Canada, um, much like the United States soon, um, in that there's a, a law in place that all new power plants are subject to a limit of 925 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour, which of course is well below a new coal plant, which would be in around 2,000. Um, so you would need either uh, CCS in place on a coal plant or you'd be limited to, to gas. Uh, this regulation is also, or law I should say, is also phasing out existing coal plants such that there will be uh, very few remaining in Canada after 2020 and just about none by, uh, 
2030. Uh, and again, the resource mix of uh, the exporting provinces will make a huge difference. Um, as, as Doug had mentioned, most of the uh, imports into the United States come from Quebec. Uh, Quebec doesn't have any coal generation. It's something in the high 90 percent hydro. Um, and they, Quebec, of course, also has a, a cap and trade program in place, so you're already pricing carbon. Um, so there's already you know, there's little incentive for, for Quebec to increase its, its fossil generation. In fact, it's, you know, encouraged not to do so. Uh, and then you've got Ontario is, is up next. Uh, they also have uh, no coal resources. And we learned recently that they're developing a cap and trade program, which will further reduce their um, demand for, for fossil generation. We've got Manitoba next. Uh, there's only one coal plant currently in operation, but it's only in operation in very limited circumstances and it's being uh, phased out. Uh, there's also a price on, on carbon in Manitoba when you're, if a plant, when plants buy uh, coal, um, they have to pay a carbon fee on top of that. Um, and then you've got British Columbia, uh, also a carbon price in place of $30 per ton, although that's an, or $30 per metric ton, a lot of, and that's uh, in Canadian. Um, and then so with all of that, you've got uh, Eighty-six percent of the exporting provinces don't have any coal, and then if you add on to that who has a, a carbon price, um, 97, about 97 percent of exporting provinces either have no coal or a carbon price or both. Um, so we see, you know, there's not really much opportunity for, um, for this accounting change between coal and, and hydro between the United States and, and Canada. Um, and then Shifting quickly to uh, possible impacts of uh, Canadian hydropower on uh, the emission rate of states. So the states that are highlighted in, in the darker shade of, of blue are just a, a handful that we looked at. Um, these states all already import a significant amount of uh, Canadian hydropower, at least 100,000 megawatt hours annually. Um, in most cases, it's a lot more than that. Um, so we wanted to explore the effects of, oh, and I should say the, the orange circles are the, are the current, um, is that generation or export? That's generation. generation. Yeah. The orange circles are uh, current generation of hydropower in, in the provinces. Um, so we wanted to explore what would happen to a state emission rate <coughs> if you're adding a little bit of, of new hydropower import. Um, so we looked at a hypothetical new 250 megawatt plant, uh, which is a modest, modest sized plant, um, and we're assuming that the importing state can use that new plant to displace coal uh, where it's available, um, otherwise gas, um, but I think California is the only state on here that wouldn't be able to displace coal uh, with new hydropower imports. And um, so the, the percentages you see there in the states are how far the state would get toward its 2030 clean power plan goal with new imports from a 250 megawatt hydro plant uh, that displaces coal. So you see there's a range, but in general, um, states can take a, a significant jump. Um, Maine could be totally done with its uh, clean power plan obligations. Again, if it just imported a, a small amount of new hydro that displaced coal. Um, Pretty, pretty strong impacts on, on the West Coast since their emission, um, emission rates are already pretty, pretty low, so you don't have that much farther to go. And then some of the Midwestern states, you can still get a pretty significant impact. Nearly Minnesota, for example, could get nearly a fifth of the way toward um, its clean power plan goal. Again, we have a lot of assumptions built in here, and there's no you know, 250 megawatt plant actually under construction, or at least none that we looked at specifically. Um, but we just wanted to kind of show for illustrative purposes um, the, the scale of the impact that, that a new uh, dam could have or, or imports from a new dam. And that is all for me. Thank you. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is David Cormy. I'm from Winnipeg uh, in Canada. And uh, thank you, Kyle, for uh, giving us a high-level perspective of, uh, 
of the Canadian situation. Um, I wanted to speak um, about the um, Canadian uh, hydropower and, and specifically in, in regard to Manitoba Hydro's uh, 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 projects and our plans for the future. Um, if I can just, there we go. And, in, and firstly, I'd just like to introduce uh, Manitoba Hydro. It's the uh, uh, government agency in Manitoba. Um, we're, we call it in Canada a Crown Corporation, much like uh, public power is in the United States. Uh, think of us as the uh, Nebraska Public Power District of, uh, of Manitoba, or, uh, a government entity. Uh, we have the monopoly uh, rights to serve the electric loads in the province. We have uh, half a million electric customers, and we also uh, are the uh, natural gas distributor for, uh, uh, for, for the province. Um, we have about uh, 5,700 megawatts of generating capacity. Um, about 5,000 of that is, uh, is hydropower. And in a normal year, uh, the vast majority of our energy production is from, from hydro, so 98% of our our electric generation is, is hydroelectric. Um, we are a major supplier of renewable energy to the, uh, to the United States, specifically states of uh, Minnesota and, uh, and Wisconsin. Um, we do that through our uh, interconnections, uh, and uh, we are a member, a coordinating member of, of, uh, of MISO. Um, because we're in, a, in another country, it's, it's uh, not possible for us to transfer the operation of our uh, generation or the responsibility of serving load to a foreign entity. So we have a, a special uh, arrangement with MISO that allows us to participate in the MISO market as if we were in the market, but legally we are uh, still in charge. Um, we've been providing um, electricity in the United States since we first interconnected in the 1970s. And uh, I think that first interconnection was done, uh, um, involved Minnesota Power, and Mr. McMillan will speak uh, in a few minutes about our long relationship. But as of today, um, our surplus energy supply is about 11% of the energy that's consumed in the state of Minnesota. I think that's a, an average over a, a period of uh, the last few years. Um, a lar large portion of that is uh, um, opportunity energy, energy that's available on a surplus on a basis, on a day-to-day -day basis, but quite a bit of it is done under long-term firm power purchase agreements um, with the uh, major utilities in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Now, <clears throat> Manitoba is blessed with a, uh, a vast watershed uh, that reaches from the Rocky Mountains out uh, in western Manitoba to the, uh, to the Great Lakes, to Lake Superior uh, in the east. It's around uh, 400,000 square miles, and just think of Manitoba being at the bottom of a, a big saucer. And the saucer was created by the, uh, the great uh, um, Agassiz glaciers, compressed the crust, and now all the water continues to drain towards the center, and, uh, and we're benefiting from, from that geography. There are four major uh, rivers uh, flowing into Manitoba, two from the west, the Saskatchewan and the Churchill River, and um, and from the, uh, from the north, from the, from the southeast, we have the Winnipeg River, drains towards Lake Winnipeg. Lake Winnipeg is a, uh, a natural lake and it's regulated within its range and so that provides the, the, the reservoir storage for the, for the hydroelectric production in the province. And um, unlike a, a, a typical reservoir where land is flooded, this lake is regulated well within its natural range. So there's no flooding associated with providing the reservoir storage in Lake Winnipeg. And then those three major rivers flowing through Lake Winnipeg then flow downstream down the Nelson River and, uh, and they reach, uh, reach the ocean uh, uh, having uh, dropped about a thousand feet from the border, the Manitoba borders to the, to the ocean. Um, so that hydroelectric production, there's a, a, when the Nelson River reaches Hudson Bay, it's around 120,000 cubic feet per second and has dropped 1,000 feet. Uh, hydroelectric potential in the province is around 10,000 megawatts. To date, we've developed around half of that, 5,000. So there's 5,000 megawatts of potential left to develop. And most of that uh, d remaining development is concentrated in the last uh, a few hundred miles uh, before the Nelson River reaches the ocean. And on, on this chart, I show the, uh, the three sites that are part of our current development plan. The, the first one, um, 
to the, in the center of the chart called the Wisquatam Station. That was brought into service in 2012. It's a 200 megawatt plant. Um, we are currently working on the kiosk site, uh, and that's a 700 megawatt station, and that, that station will come into service in 2019 or early 2020. And the third uh, leg of our development plan is the Conawap station. It's a 1500 megawatt site, and we haven't yet uh, committed to, to building that project, but it, it could be in service in uh, as early as 2030. Um, Doug described the, uh, the nature of, uh, of hydro, and those, those hydro projects along the Nelson River are run a river with the storage provided in Lake Winnipeg. And so the, the reservoirs are well within the banks, and, and, and the flows that leave Lake Winnipeg are essentially the flows that arrive um, down, down the river at the stations. Um, Manitoba is much like the other Canadian hydroelectric utilities, um, BC Hydro in the, in the west and Quebec Hydro in the east. And you'll see that the strong interconnections between the two countries are essentially from the hydroelectric utilities. Uh, we interconnected uh, for reliability reasons. Um, we're on the periphery of the North American electric grid. Um, but there was also a strong incentive to trade because hydroelectric utilities have surplus. And rather than having the water wasted, it's better to, uh, to sell it into the, into the U.S. where there's a big enough market to, uh, to absorb that large surpluses. Um, and, and so that kind of, that, those kind of benefits and uh, uh, you know, tr reliability and trade were the reasons for interconnection up to you know, around 2000. And then as the climate and, uh, and, 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 and emissions became more of an issue, um, lots of interest in uh, purchasing Canadian electricity because it was clean. And in the, in, in the most recent years, the focus has now been on its, uh, uh, there are no carbon emissions associated with uh, with uh, hydroelectricity. And um, as, as the renewables in the United States have developed, um, the value of Canadian storage is becoming more prominent. And so now that's another reason why uh, we want to increase uh, a trade because we can provide storage. As, uh, as, as New York has, uh, has, has worked with uh, Quebec, Manitoba is now working with MISO to provide that uh, balancing, moment by moment balancing service to the, uh, to the uh, ISOs. Um, <clears throat> this is a chart that shows the 100-year history of water flows in Manitoba. You can see it goes up and down. There's a huge amount of variability. Uh, we have a, 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 a prairie hydrology, uh, periods of drought and periods of floods. And uh, the black line along the center there uh, shows what the average uh, flow is. And you can see there um, that in the, th the driest years, there's um, uh, only 40% of the average flow can be expected. And that, that, that's the, the criteria that we use for determining what guaranteed power can the hydro project produce. And so anything that's above the minimum flow on record ends up being surplus energy. And in Manitoba's case, uh, um, our dependable hydro is about 15 terawatt hours right now. Our average hydro is around 30 terawatt hours, so we have around, we have around 15 terawatt hours of surplus on average. And if we have a high water year, uh, you know, flood year, we can have uh, uh, another 50% on top of that. So huge amount of uh, uh, variability v makes interconnecting very important because during those drought years, we can import. And during the high water years, we can sell the surplus. And, um, and so that's the, uh, that's the uh, um, on average, you can say there's going to be a large amount of surplus. You can't guarantee in what year it's going to be because you, never, you don't know in advance when, when the droughts and when the floods are going to come. But on average, you can see that there's a, a large volume of, of surplus energy. Now, that, the availability of that surplus energy to the market is limited by our generating capacity. We don't have enough generators installed in the system to capture every drop of water that flows down the river in a flood. That is p potentially possible by by putting more capacity in at the existing stations. And we don't have enough interconnected capability to get that market. So there are capacity limitations, could be either generation or transmission, that, that limit um, um, the amount of surplus that can reach the market. Um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, storage is becoming much more valuable uh, to the market as renewables are, are, um, are developed in the US. And as we were developing our project uh, the, the Great Northern Transmission Line with Minnesota Power, we worked with MISO on a wind synergy study to demonstrate what the value of that storage was to the, uh, to the region. 
And um, this is looking at um, dispatch of hydro in, in five-minute increments and seeing how it responds to prices. So imagine you have a reservoir with water in it that, and the value of the water, the value of the inventory has a price. And so when market prices goes above the value of inventory, you want to sell out of the storage. And when the, when, the, when the market price is lower than the value of the inventory, you want to fill the reservoir up with, with, with cheap power. And so um, this modeling that was done by, um, by MISO uh, looked at the, uh, the synergies that are available by, by increasing the size of the interconnection between Manitoba and, uh, and MISO and, um, and, and looked at the, the, how it affected the dispatch and the efficiency of the operation of, of, the, of all the other MISO generation. Um, <clears throat> this is just a chart that shows for a, uh, a few hours in a particular day, the red line indicating how the wind is going up and down. Um, and then, and as wind in MISO goes up and down, the, the power price goes up and down. For every thousand megawatts of wind that's generated, prices drop by about a dollar right now. So if there's 10,000 megawatts, um, you can see the price in a particular hour go down by as, you know, between 10 and $15. So if, you're, if, if the hydro is responsive to that price signal as shown in the, in the blue line, when the, when, the, when the market price drops below the value of inventory, the hydro backs off and says, I better, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to store that water. And so this just shows how that when there's more wind, lower price as a result, and hydro can store. And that hydro, that hydro storage can take place in five minute increments. And uh, MISO estimated that under um, the, the, uh, uh, in the year 2027, with our new interconnection built and with both uh, Kiask and Kahnawapa constructed, that there were uh, low um, cost savings in the order of $400 million a year um, as a result of, of a more efficient uh, operation of, of, of the generation fleet. And depending on what economic scenario you used, uh, that number ranged between 200 million and uh, 1.3 billion. So uh, relative to the cost of the new transmission line, these, 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 these synergy benefits are, are, are significant. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure I need to say much more about um, um, uh, the uh, Manitoba uh, energy. We are, uh, all our, all our hydro generation is registered in Emirates. And we track that uh, using a, a region-wide uh, tracking system. And so, um, you know, if the uh, we, we've demonstrated that that you know that we can keep track, and there's no no double counting going on. Um, <clears throat> the uh, EPA already recognizes the value of Canadian hydro because we displace carbon, we displace carbon generation, and, and that, that that shows up already in uh, um, in in when you when you're dealing with NOx and SOx and and other emissions. So. Um, you know, we've got a, a, a good record of, of having a, a positive effect on, on, on the environment. This is just a table that shows uh, um, some of the agencies and entities in, 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 in the United States that have recognized the value of increased Canadian hydro. Um, the utilities like Minnesota Power and XL Energy and Great River Energy, those are the, the custom, some of the main customers. Um, and uh, they see the value in having more Canadian hydro and having it recognized under 111D. And, uh, and then also there was favorable comments from uh, Wisconsin and Maine and Michigan and Minnesota also speaking favorably about increased uh, um, Canadian uh, hydro imports. Um, and I, I don't think I need to say much about here because I think uh, Kyle addressed this issue, um, you know, the issue of leakage. Um, you know, the one, one small coal plant that we do have in Manitoba that's left uh, online, but as soon as the kiosk station comes on service in 2020, we'll shut that down. We, don't, we won't need that anymore. And so uh, the issue of, of increasing exports and then, having to re and then replacing it with, carbon, with coal generation in Manitoba is a non-issue. Um, and, um, you know, so I think the issues of leakage are, uh, are, 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 are well protected. Uh, by um, the Canadian legislation. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, my presentation, and uh, I'll take some questions later. Thanks, Jeff. Good morning, and thanks uh, to our prior speakers. It's a pleasure to be here, and 
I will uh, just say I'm going to make my exit here when we're done and go down to the fourth floor. I have the good fortune and the privilege of chairing the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation Board, so I'm going to go see that Manitoba art as soon as we're done talking about Manitoba energy. Looking forward to that. So uh, um, what I want to do is make sure I get the right piece there, the right piece of technology. Talk first of all about uh, Elite. I happen to be an officer of Elite, which is the parent company of Minnesota Power, but about 90% of our... Uh, of our business is made up of Minnesota Power. So I want to talk a little bit about its energy strategy because it's integral to what uh, we're doing with Manitoba Hydro and uh, it's also, I think, integral to a, a very classic example of how federal policy with the Clean Power Plan can, uh, can, can affect that and how it will affect it if uh, it goes one way or the other give you a little bit of a sense of the, the partnership that we've got in place, talk a little bit more in detail about the contracts and the uh, power line, the contracts with Manitoba and the joint effort to uh, build the Great Northern Line and then uh, close up with some thoughts about policy, which our coming speakers will uh, have a chance to talk about as well. So Elite is really an energy company that's invested in some additional infrastructure and related services. Minnesota Power is, a, is an investor-owned utility, the second largest one in Minnesota, but the third largest overall utility. We've got uh, Excel, of course, up there, and then a very large, I think, second largest cooperative in the country, G&T Cooperative, is Great River Energy, and then, uh, and then we're there next in terms of size of Minnesota utilities. We've got public power and uh, a couple other investor owns too, but uh, that makes up the, uh, the world of Minnesota energy producers across the harbor. In Superior, we have a small um, distribution utility that we own, and then we're also a 9% owner, or 8 or 9% of uh, the American Transmission Company, which is essentially the Wisconsin utilities who divested their transmission some time ago and uh, we helped get a big line built into the center of the state there from Duluth and uh, through that we became an owner of, uh, of that interesting transco. We have also several energy and infrastructure businesses which I, uh, which I mentioned and can show you here. I've talked about what we've got in, uh, in Minnesota. You can see our, our service territory here and uh, that is really northeastern, north central, and northern Minnesota, big industrial customer base that I'll talk about there. Um, we've also invested recently into uh, wind generation across the country, buying projects that uh, have uh, gotten to a point in their economic life where somebody wanted to sell and somebody wanted to buy. That's non-regulated, non-utility generation across the state you see up there. We're very close to uh, closing on a deal to uh, purchase a big wind farm in Pennsylvania, so we're heading east as well. Again, unrelated to the Minnesota Power Utility operations, but uh, closing in on 500 megawatts of, of wind there. And then lastly, we've also recently uh, invested in a water services business. We think the energy water nexus is pretty critical. You can't have uh, energy without water, and you probably can't have water without energy. So we're looking at that space as well. That's enough about uh, about Elite, Minnesota Power is, as I said, about 90, close to 90 percent of uh, the earnings, the business, everything about Elite. So it is the place where I spend most of uh, my time. And I think it's important, you might wonder why am I doing such a deep dive on this, but you really need a sense of who our customers are to get a sense of how important price competitiveness and reliability are for us. And uh, so you can see some of the logos up there of big uh, steel companies, international steel companies. Those, uh, those steel firms or taconite mining firms account for, you know, close to uh, half in, to in total if you think of paper. We also uh, turn wood pulp into things like paper and uh, rayon and rayon substitutes and all that. So really the economy in northern Minnesota is about converting resources into uh, products. Most of that is mineral related, iron ore, but some of it's also paper. So they're, they're insanely price competitive and price sensitive customers and uh, they also use a lot of power all around the clock. Our system has the highest uh, system load factor of any utility in the country, I think running mm -hmm. north of 80 percent most of the time. We're a typical, you know, more res uh, 
a residential and commercial service uh, utility like Excel, for instance, serving the Twin Cities might be 40% residential, 40% commercial, and about 20% industrial. We're literally flipped with uh, half our load being industrial and about a quarter of the total being classic residential commercial. So why do, again, I, I, I really emphasize that point because price competitiveness, reliability, and baseload resources are vitally important to us. So what are we doing with that customer mix to try to stay affordable, stay reliable, and do a better job uh, for the environment overall? We've uh, effectuated what we call our energy forward strategy. In 2005, the utility, let's call it 1,800 megawatts of generation roughly, we were 5% renewable. We happen to be the largest hydroelectric producer in Minnesota. The largest tributary of, uh, of Lake Superior is the St. Louis River, so we capture hundred some megawatts there total and we also generate on the Mississippi River and uh, and into the uh, same watershed that uh, Manitoba Hydro gets its Winnipeg River resources up in the north total of maybe 130 140 megawatts which tiny compared to everything we're talking about today but is the largest uh, resource hydro resource in uh, Minnesota so turn the clock back to 20 2005 we had those hydro resources and a couple small biomass plants, and we were 5% renewable, 95% coal. Bring it forward one decade, we fi we'll finish this year, we finished last year actually, having added 500 megawatts of wind in North Dakota, some wind in Minnesota, and uh, invested in our biomass plants to the point where we are today 25% renewable and 75% coal, and when we close the loop with Manitoba Hydro and connect the Great Northern Line north and south of the border and bring that online in 2020. We will be fully 36, 37 percent renewable and uh, you can do the math with what's left for coal. Our long-term goal by the end of the next decade, not this one, but sometime in, we don't have a deadline for this yet, uh, clean power plant and other things will affect that, but we'd like to be a third renewable really big scale, really good wind that I'll talk a little bit more out in North Dakota. Um, the Canadian Hydro to come with that, that's a third. A third coal, really our, our largest and most effect, uh, efficient uh, baseload coal plants would remain and we'll close out our, our small coal ultimately and then a third in the middle, some combination of market and natural gas. And uh, ideally we'd add more renewable to that but uh, making sure we get our our uh, clean power policy correct and some of that is going to drive what we do and uh, just how much gas. We haven't added any gas yet but that's uh, that's coming next. So Manitoba Hydro and the, the, uh, the Great Northern Line are vital adding 10, 11, 12 percent of uh, our renewable in one, one nice jump. So important stuff and uh, we are very serious about the about our long-term environmental compliance and we've tried to act early which is one of our I'll throw an editorial comment in here the clean power plan is uh, in its draft form tends to be a little light in terms of recognizing early actors we think EPA is uh, is planning to do something about that but for those of us operating in states like Minnesota where the policy is very aggressive we were not we're not ahead of California, but we're almost tied with them in terms of when and how much, and there's talk going on in the session right now to up that again. We acted early and uh, invested, and we want to be sure for our customers' sake we get, uh, we get credit for that. I mentioned coal, and uh, we're not here to talk about coal today, but I uh, just wanted to say we've, uh, we've put about a quarter of a million dollars into our largest unit to make sure it's MATS compatible. That's really a brand new scrubber on that. And again, really just to make sure you're thinking about a three-part balanced, a third, a third, a third type of uh, program going forward. That's probably the last major investment we'll make in coal and uh, takes us out through that 2035, 2038 time frame in terms of uh, you know, planned life of those assets. So if you think long, long term, what comes next, that's the time frame to think about that last third that we'll have on our system. Now much more, or much probably more interesting to this group and, uh, and critical to our long-term supply outlook is uh, an investment since 2009 of about $840 million 
in what we think is some of the very best wind in the country out in the middle of North Dakota. Um, we've averaged uh, capacity factors north of 40 percent, approaching 45 percent across the year on that, uh, on that North Dakota wind, so it's good stuff. And uh, we also traded with uh, the, those of you that know the co-op world, Minn Kota, uh, power cooperative, we effectively swapped a power plant that we had, that we had built with them out in North Dakota, a lignite mine mouth plant. We swapped that for a, for a 460 mile DC line. We got the transmission line, they take the coal plant over time, and we have replaced that lignite energy effectively with uh, wind energy as we've added to our, our wind resources. So I'll show you a map in a little bit, but it shows the, uh, the wind coming in from the uh, west, and when we get the uh, Great Northern Belt, the uh, hydroelectric energy coming in from the, from the uh, north. But what's important here is that's uh, really that's the largest uh, wind facility at a single location in North Dakota. North Dakota is a great state to do that kind of business in. They're energy rich and energy friendly and energy policy friendly. And uh, we've, uh, we've really experienced good, uh, good results building and adding wind out there. Interesting policy piece, though, is when we get to St. Paul and visit with our legislators, there's always a lot of interest in local stuff. But uh, the reality is we think the best thing we can do for our customers is to find the cheapest and uh, most cost-effective resources and 45 percent capacity factor wind is a far, far, far cry better than the 28 to probably 32, 33, 34 percent capacity factor wind we can find in Minnesota. You probably need transmission from either, so the double down we had was the existing transmission line coupled with that high capacity factor wind. We're excited about it. And then you add the Canadian hydro piece to this, the Manitoba hydro piece, and we think we've, uh, we've really found the best two and most optimal resources we, we can bring together for meeting you know, high energy intensive, uh, price sensitive customer needs and uh, do very well by the environment. So the guts of, of our deal with, uh, with Mr. Cormie and our friends at Manitoba Hydro, as he mentioned, uh, we've got a four decade long partnership um, some of the earliest and most creative uh, trading opportunities that occurred in what's today become MISO were done with that company and uh, we're really proud of our, our track record with them. But uh, we, in 2010, finalized the 250 megawatt 15 year deal that starts in 2020 and ends in 2035 and uh, we'll buy about a million and a half megawatt hours over that time frame so effectively base load power and uh, we'll do so at a price that uh, is set and uh, moves around a little bit with some escalators, gas as part of it, uh, implicit price deflators, that kind of thing. You don't want to get into the, the details of that. But it's a, it's a very nice base load deal. And then last year, we finished a supplementary deal to buy another 133 megawatts of energy, not base load capacity and energy, just energy. But uh, it, it roughly rounds out to, it could be as from a million and a half up to uh, two million megawatt hours a year. And here's another key piece of when you think about that, with that comes about a million megawatt hours of storage rights that we have on their system. And when we get the line built, we have the ability, Manitoba has the ability, as David told you, they don't want other people controlling their system. And uh, what we've agreed with them is when we have too much wind, not enough load or low loads, you're going to keep the hydro and they may physically store it. We could, we could if we want, when we get the transmission line done, actually move power that direction. More typically, it'll be a financial transaction that they will dictate in terms of how and when to do that. But it matches up just beautifully with us without us having to invest a dollar in any kind of uh, new storage, you know, electric storage resource we utilize their geography and their system to do it. So that's a 2020 to 2040 deal, the, the 133 megawatts all told, you know, north of 380 approaching 400 megawatts of, uh, of power supply and uh, really a vital part of the, trans, the, the overall transaction. I've got a better map coming up, but the transmission line is uh, critical and we should probably, this is uh, as good a map as I, we have. Here's our headquarters in Duluth, Minnesota. And, uh, and we're talking about this is the line. That's not a very good 
actual route map of it, but connecting 500 kV AC line up to the Manitoba hydro system where their DC lines come down to just south of, uh, of Winnipeg and we'll interconnect it all here and then we use DC technology to bring the, uh, the wind in from the west. So this is the piece that's in play right now. We're uh, very, very far along. We expect a, a certificate of need recommendation, a positive recommendation from our uh, Minnesota Public Utilities Commission very soon and uh, the routing process is going well as well as any routing process can go as we navigate the uh, the relatively uninhabited but uh, very economic or environmentally sensitive regions of uh, of northern Minnesota and then there's a parallel process going on with David and his his company in Winnipeg as they bring that down and uh, we'll meet at the border. We are going to meet, right David? We are. <laughs> okay. As he likes to remind me, there's no load at the border, so two transmission lines that don't connect would be a bad thing, but uh, they don't pay me to engineer anything, so I think that's probably reasonably safe. So as we think about uh, the virtues of, uh, of uh, Canadian hydroelectric development, I think I, w what I put this slide together for was to give you a sense of how we look at it, and uh, it really enhances overall regional reliability provides a lot of energy market benefits. Um, nobody can bring the kind of uh, energy into a marketplace like Manitoba Hydro can. David talked to you about the, the size and scope of, uh, of their surplus energy potential. MISO's going to speak to you coming up, but I doubt there's a, a market participant out there that brings the kind of megawatt hours to market that they do on a, a seasonal basis and uh, generally a good thing for price sensitive customers, add more megawatts, build you know more uh, transmission lines and we've got a more robust, not only uh, electric grid, but a much more robust energy market with a lot more megawatt hours in it. Um, it diversifies our energy mix. As I said, it uh, has load following capability and wind storage uh, properties that I know of nothing else like it other than another system, say Quebec or, uh, or BC and uh, we like to we think it uh, is amazingly valuable to both com both countries. Um, thinking about policy and some policy challenges, I threw a couple of them out here. I don't think that uh, we properly value that storage capability. I don't, and I, it isn't the EPA's job to figure out what electric storage is worth. But uh, between the the FERC and the EPA and the Department of Energy in our state regulators, which of course in uh, the U.S. Are, are vitally important. I think there's a missed value there. I uh, think that grid stability is another key one. I'll leave that to uh, the experts at MISO to perhaps talk about, but they add a lot of value there. And of course, carbon-free resources is a, uh, is a big one. Enough's been said about double counting. MRETS, the uh, Midwest uh, Renewable Energy, tracking system is incredibly complex or incredibly sophisticated and uh, works well that we don't think there's any need to reinvent uh, any uh, wheels in that regard and uh, Minnesota energy policy is vitally important here we're not here necessarily to talk about state policies but while we want EPA to recognize the value of this Canadian hydro and make it a counting resource we first need to make sure states like Minnesota do that and uh, We've got some work to do there as well. So I'm not, uh, if you want, we can visit about what might be happening in the states, but uh, we can't find renewable solutions that are cost effective, reliable, and really work well in Minnesota if we don't look around the borders and uh, look, or look, or look to our neighbors for some help there. And lastly, the EPA, or not lastly, but second to last, it's really vital that the EPA get it right in terms of cross border, now I'm talking interstate border resources. Obviously we've made a bet on North Dakota. If North Dakota ends up counting that 500 megawatts of wind that we developed at Minnesota policymaker requests and with Minnesota customer money, um, that's not going to work for us long term. So our number one issue in the clean power plan is to make sure that you don't draw lines at the state border that don't reflect the rationale and the reasons why the the renewable resources were built in the first place. Coupled with that then obviously we want to see international hydro work and we think we are a poster child for why it can work so well. My last bullet there is, uh, is just one to leave you thinking about. Without a price on carbon 
natural gas tends to win most, if not all, of the resource planning decisions and processes going on around the country. And uh, while I'd, I'd uh, like to think that isn't always going to be true, I think the next resource we add will be gas, and it still comes with a lot of carbon. The solutions we're talking about here today don't come with any carbon, but they're not going to really happen until I think we move forward and get a price on carbon so gas doesn't have, and I'm not anti-gas, but uh, it, it has a bit of an advantage today. And I think its long-term carbon implications are significantly overlooked as we do our energy planning going forward. So I will leave it at that. There's a nice picture of a, David can tell you which facilities those are up on the, uh, up on the Nelson River, but North Dakota Wind and uh, Nelson River Hydro all coming together for the benefit of folks in Minnesota. Thank you. I'm going to give you guys a little warning. I might tell a couple jokes during this, and that doesn't mean that I don't take this very seriously, but uh, just try and liven it up a little bit. Uh, thanks to uh, the Wilson Center for the invitation here and, and C2ES for the work you guys are doing on your, on your white paper. I think you really teed up the issues here. I might sound like a little bit of a refrain, but I'm going to take this from a, a little bit different perspective um, and look forward to the discussion we all have together. I think we should call ourselves the guys with glasses for the panel discussion later. <laughs> Uh, I am Brian Ryberic. I'm from MISO. That's the Mid-Continent mid Independent System Operator. I am an interregional director. In a minute, I'll uh, try and explain what that means. Sometimes I don't even know. Uh, but today, I'm going to call myself the international director because of our subject matter. And Dave, I'm hoping one day you invite me back here and I get to call myself an intergalactic director <laughs> if we figure something out on that front. I'm going to provide you a few things, a, a brief overview of MISO, what we do and who we are, an identification of how Canadian Hydro, specifically Manitoba Hydro, plays into our system and give you a high-level overview of the work we've been uh, performing, the analysis we've been doing around the, the Clean Power Plan and some of our observations there. A uh, little audience interaction for you. Hopefully, I don't actually use you, but uh, a challenge to all of you. Uh, we are in an acronym-laden world here, and we actually have a policy at MISO that if we use an unexplained acronym, the speaker has to give a donation to our corporate uh, um, charity, which is Make-A-Wish Foundation. So keep me on track. I want to see hands go up if I, uh, if I use an acronym that, uh, that I don't explain. I do have to make some exceptions here. MISO obviously is, is, is okay. Uh, EPA probably everybody knows what that is. FERC, we normally, uh, we normally let that one slide as well. So there you go. Uh, a credential that, uh, that would not appear in my bio that, uh, that I've been preparing for this panel for a long time. Uh, whilst a student at the University of Wisconsin, I took an economics class and I wrote a paper entitled NAFTA HAFTA. So uh, I feel like I've been really getting ready for this uh, for a number of years now. And then a serious disclaimer, um, talking about the EPA's Clean Power Plan, uh, MISO does not have a position on whether this is good policy or bad policy. Uh, whether it's legal, illegal, and all the other controversies that are surrounding it, uh, that's really a question for others to resolve. We are very focused on fulfilling our mission of bringing value to our customers uh, and ensuring reliability and trying to find ways to implement whatever the final rule is in, uh, in a least cost way and working with our states and stakeholders to do that. Uh, we, we did not take a position, as, as uh, noted, I think, in and David Cormies, I will also point out, you can just say David right now. Oh, David said, and there's like five of them up here. But um, uh, David kind of put a list of all the people that had uh, supported Canadian uh, Hydro in, in the EPA. We were not on that list, um, but certainly we see great value in, in Manitoba Hydro, uh, both today and, and in the future, and I hope I impress upon that here today. So what's a MISO? We are not the soup, in fact, if that's what you thought. Um, we are the electric grid operator from coast to coast, if you consider Hudson Bay one coast and uh, the Gulf of Mexico another coast. Um, I, this, this might be a little risky to use this joke, but I'm going to go for it anyway. You might notice that we are fully within the continent. So when, when we added our south region uh, in 2013, which is this orange region down here, we, had to, we were the Midwest ISO and we had to change our name. 
And uh, since we are fully within the continent, you could argue that we are the incontinent ISO. <laughs> and I, wanted, I was not going to use that, but then when we started talking about leakage earlier, I'm like, I got to go there. <laughs> so uh, we have a very big geographic scope. You can kind of see some of our numbers of what we do. What, what happens is, is members of ours, like, like Minnesota Power, uh, turn over functional control of their transmission assets, and we run that. Uh, electric grid. We are a 501c4 uh, organization, so we're not for profit. Um, uh, we have control centers in Egan, Minnesota, just outside of Minneapolis, uh, Carmel, Indiana, which is our headquarters, and just newly minted in Little Rock, Arkansas to support our south region. Uh, we're governed by a nine-member board uh, currently. It's going to increase to ten members. They are independent directors. Uh, one member is our CEO, uh, and so we are, we are uh, governed that way. A membership in MISO, as in all RTOs, is voluntary. So when Minnesota Power decides to, to join MISO, they have to see value in what we do uh, in order to, to join that. We're advised by a stakeholder process that has hundreds and hundreds of meetings uh, every, every year. So if you want to really attend a lot of meetings, become a MISO member. I think we are supporting the catering industries in, in Egan, Minnesota, Carmel, Indiana, and Little Rock, Arkansas, almost single-handedly. But what do we really do? Um, I think it comes down to three main functions. We are ensuring reliability on the system at all times. So we're operating the transmission grid, the bulk electric system, to make sure that there are no faults in that. And we're looking at contingencies every four minutes, about 11,000 uh, contingencies every four minutes, uh, sort of acting as an air traffic controller of the grid. Uh, we are engaged in wholesale market management, so we have markets ranging from an annual voluntary capacity auction to a day-ahead market, a real-time market, and then also an ancillary services market uh, to essentially find the most cost-effective resources to serve load at any, at any moment. That's, that's kind of the function of our markets. And then, uh, in fact, we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary of our uh, day-ahead market on April 1st this year, so we had a giant party. It was great. Um, we also run uh, transmission planning studies, and I'll talk a little bit about some of that uh, today as well. But that is, we're looking long-term, what is the transmission that's going to be needed to have a reliable system in the future, also bring market efficiency, and serve our public policy functions as well. What does that all mean for consumers? A few years ago, um, after we had started up, uh, we had a number of stakeholders ask us, what value are you bringing to us? And we decided to engage in a study called our value proposition study that sort of depicts what our value proposition is to stakeholders uh, to quantify our value, worked with our, our stakeholders, our regulators, and, and others to kind of identify a number of metrics and uh, identify the, the value we've improved or value we've brought through improved grid reliability, increased efficiencies using the generation that we have on the system today. We kind of do it in ranges because some of this is, is a little bit difficult to, to quantify, but you can see more efficient use of existing assets, uh, reduced need to build additional assets, which is a, a huge chunk of our, our benefit. Then we got a little bit of cost that's mainly my salary. Um, <laughs> and uh, then you can see it's about 2.2 to 3.1 billion dollars of of annual economic benefit, and whether you're using Canadian dollars or American dollars, I think that's uh, that's a pretty good good thing for consumers. What do we do with Manitoba Hydro? Where does our relationship there fit? And you've heard a little bit about it from the Daves um, uh, earlier, but it's very easy to describe our relationship as as synergistic. And I think you've heard a little bit already about how when they're building dams, which are very large assets and big chunks of, of megawatts, we consider that sort of lumpy investment. That's something you might hear in the, in the industry. They're, they're lumps because they're big, big chunks of megawatts. And so having a market to be able to sell in the, the excess energy is obviously very beneficial to them. As, as Dave also noted, as a coordinating member, so they're, they, they kind of don't fit exactly into a market participant. Manitoba Hydro doesn't, and, and you heard the reasons why. As a crown corporation, they can't turn over functional control of their assets to us. And so we kind of have this, this system. It's called the External Asynchronous Resource Tariff. It's, I'm going to go bottom up on this slide. Um, that allows them to sell into our market. Now, recently, um, they're able to actually buy out of our market. So you kind of heard this idea of trying to manage their water flows better. So when our market prices are lower, now um, Manitoba Hydro is actually able to buy off of our marketplace. So it's a bi-directional uh, situation, I think, that brings benefits to both, uh, to both entities. So 
uh, we call that the, uh, again, the external asynchronous resource tariff or the year. So we got to figure out something that's like the end year energy assessment or something like that so we can get eyes and ears. But uh, yeah, anyway. Um, so we went live with that on March 1st, and I, I think that's been a benefit to both sides. Uh, from MISO's perspective, and we, we sort of touched on this quite a bit already, but it has been a critical asset as our generation portfolio has changed dramatically. And, and we did a study, uh, Dave had it up on his slide, the Manitoba Wind Synergy Study, and we identified certainly a lot of benefits that are shown. Um, and, and Doug identified, and maybe I've mischaracterized this, but we call it sort of like a supersized pump storage plant. And there is a difference here, obviously, where they're not pumping water up into the river, so there's not the loss of energy associated with a pump storage plant. But it provides us with the opportunity to dispatch, and it's a very fast ramping uh, product. So when we build a lot of wind on our system, and my next slide is going to show you how dramatically that has changed on the MISO system, uh, which is an intermittent resource, and that's going up and down all the time to have this this giant sort of, of pool of water that we can kind of dispatch and, and flow and and smooth out the the system as a whole. It's it's really a great asset to the system. So that's what we found in that study. There's a couple other things we found in that study, and one I want to touch on, and it's a total ancillary benefit that's gonna that's gonna prove to be massive to us as we look at the clean power plan, but. Uh, when we started working with Manitoba Hydro on the Synergy study, we looked at a new tool that we had not used before. It's a model called the Plexus model. And it's, it's a, essentially a, a production cost model at its root, but it has a bunch of other modules associated with it. And we had not used it before in our transmission planning studies, but we used it with Manitoba and we learned a lot of great lessons. Uh, through that, and now we're actually going to be using that in our clean power plant analysis. So it was sort of the start of, of an education process for MISO that I don't know that we knew it was going to have this benefit at the time, but it really did help us out. Um, uh, the other pieces that we talked about I think are, are key, and, and as they expand their system, we also looked in that study of expanding some additional transmission into the future, and I think as we look at the clean power plan, regardless of whether uh, hydro is counted under some of the ideas that, that Doug and Kyle uh, brought to the table, it's still going to be an important asset as we look to probably increase wind on our system regardless of, of the counting of, of Manitoba Hydro. So here's, here's a, the depiction of, of just what happened on our system from 2006 to, and we're, we're forecasting out here, but uh, we'll get you to, to 14 and now starting looking into 15. Um, mainly driven by RPS mandates, but this is a massive shift in the amount of intermittent resources that are on the system. You're going from just over 1,000 megawatts in 2006 to about 18,000 megawatts if you look 10 years later in 2016. So not only is it important to have Manitoba Hydro, which has these, these qualities of a, a fast ramping storage facility, but it's also very important to have this geographic diversity because as, as uh, Dave McMillan pointed out, a lot of our wind happens to be out here in this, in this portion of our footprint. And so to have a, a resource up here that's fast ramping and to have sort of the rest of the machine uh, to balance out uh, all that wind is very critical to us. And, and has allowed us, uh, but for that, I don't think we would have been able to have this expansion of wind energy on a reliable basis and certainly not uh, with the economic benefits that we've been able to show. So turning our attention to the clean power plan, I want to start actually by pointing out that it's, uh, it's not an individual operator. Um, there are a bunch of other uh, EPA rules that are, are taking effect. In fact, uh, Dave McMillan noted with their Boswell unit, they've done some updates. Uh, related to MATS here, which is the mercury and air toxic standards. All right, you, I wanted, I was hoping to see some hands when I said MATS. Uh, it went into effect this month, the cross-state air pollution rule and uh, the ozone rules that I think we're going to see under the national ambient air quality standards. When you put all these together, for MISO, uh, it keeps us up at night because of this, which is, this is our current energy mix and I, I will admit I skewed this a little bit. This is only looking at our north and central regions, so let me go back to the map quick. So it's looking at the, the blue and green uh, areas. Our south region is a little bit more heavy towards gas, so I'm, I'm pulling that out to, to illustrate a point, and that is uh, on an energy basis, this is what we dispatched from 2009 to 2013, and you see a little bit of a decrease in the, the big bar is coal, 
you see a little bit of a decrease, a little uptick in 2013. You'll probably see that go down a little bit more in, in our 2014 numbers. But we're, we're still very, very heavily dependent on coal. And when you look <laughs> at this Chevron, this is all going to have impacts on, on coal facilities. So we're going to see a major change in our, in our resource mix over, over time here, not just the increase of wind that we've seen, but uh, additional changes as well. So in preparation for those changes, and I do want to point out, I try to match my tie with the background of the phase one and phase two. So um, uh, we've been doing a lot of analysis on the clean power plan, just getting ourselves ready for that. Our phase one study looked uh, mainly at the draft rule, obviously, and looked at the impact that it would have on capacity expansions. This was largely designed, um, and we also looked in phase two at reliability issues largely designed to inform us as we made our comments to the EPA and to inform our stakeholders as they made their comments. Uh, we used a capacity expansion model, looked at a variety of scenarios, about 1,300 in total, of different ways you can comply with the draft rule. And uh, I'll give you three key observations out of that. First, that regional compliance can reduce costs. And that is by looking at the MISO system as a whole, rather than on a sub-regional basis or a state-by-state -state basis, uh, you, you see a lot of benefits of scope and scale, uh, including non-trivial amounts of savings, about 30 percent uh, less by looking at a regional solution versus a state-by-state -state solution. And when we're talking billions and billions of dollars here, 30 percent of, of cost savings is obviously very significant. Uh, a second observation is that a lot of our lower cost options, so when you get into those cost savings, one of the main drivers of that was the number of retirements that you have of your current coal fleet. So we expect about 12.6 gigawatts of retirements uh, due to the mercury and air toxic standard. And when we started modeling this, an additional 14 gigawatts of retirements of coal facilities would be sort of the lower cost uh, clusters of, of scenarios that, that we saw. So that's another 25% of our coal fleet retiring, uh, which is a, a massive change to our system. Uh, and then third, and I'll, I'll talk about this again in the next slide, is timing issues are very, very concerning to us uh, with respect to the draft clean power plant rule. Uh, in phase two, uh, we also looked at reliability, and this was kind of a gut check for us. It was if we take those 14 gigawatts of retirements that we expect, drop them out of the system and add nothing else on, what happens? Lo and behold, you get a whole bunch of reliability problems. And I think that was more of a gut check to make sure that, that A, that's, that's, that's true. Intuitively, it makes a lot of sense. But also to start looking at where are those big reliability issues and where do we need to start focusing some attention. Phase three now, this is where we're turning to using the Plexus model, which we started using uh, with Manitoba Hydro when we studied the, the wind synergies. Um, it really builds upon our phase one and phase two modeling and looks at uh, a number of things that we heard from our stakeholders, including state level modeling, and that maybe requires a little explanation. When you go back to the map, I'm going to give somebody a seizure going back and forth here. Um, and this is our reliability footprint, and it doesn't truly depict those who are in our market, but I can give you some examples here where Arkansas is in MISO, but not all of Arkansas is in MISO. Illinois is in MISO, but there's a PJM portion of, of Arkansas. There's also a PJM portion of, of Indiana. So we modeled the MISO footprint when we looked at our phase one and phase two studies. Now we have heard from a lot of our states that you know, gee whiz, we're going to have to comply uh, as a state. So can you look at it from a state by state basis? So we are going to be doing that. We're also going to be including electric transmission costs. We just looked at capacity expansion in the phase one and phase two. Phase three will actually look and say what transmission will be needed uh, to actually facilitate the building of that capacity. Um, we'll do some more detailed economic production and reliability analyses. And then I think most importantly, or most interesting to me, uh, Plexus actually has a module on it that uh, interfaces with the, with the gas industry, so it allows for simultaneous dispatch of gas and electricity, which, while that may not be exactly how the system works today, we kind of want to see not only is there congestion on the electric transmission system, but is there congestion on the gas system, because that, that opens up another, another box of, of Pandora. And, um, of concern that if you are going to have a lot of gas expansion, do you need more infrastructure there as well? So we're going to actually do the modeling on the draft rule now to kind of give us a proof of concept and make sure that we're running the model and understand all the outputs. And then when the final rule comes out, we'll be able to hit the ground running pretty hard. So look for that. 
So this is uh, probably our biggest insight, and this is what most of our comments focused on with the EPA uh, draft rule. It's, it's something we identified, and I think others have as well. It's the 2020 cliff issue. I'm a skier, so I like to use a little different analogy. Instead of the Thelma and Louise cliff, I like to think of this as um, we're learning to ski right now, and we're going to start reducing carbon, and that's, that's sort of my analogy is we're, we just got to the ski hill, and we're going to try and learn how to ski. And normally when you learn how to ski, where do you start? On the bunny hill, right? You, you put your boots on, you kind of walk around a little funny, get on that bunny hill and you start sliding down, you get all freaked out, you fall down. Uh, my view is EPA kind of gave us those boots, we walk, walked around a little funny and then they said, hey, here's this double black diamond with all these moguls on it, go for it, guys. Um, and really it's a question of math, right? This is the 2020 to, 20, or to 2029 interim targets and you have to hit an average over that period of time. And if you don't start right away, if you don't have a huge drop off in 2020, you're never going to be able to make it up and you're going to have to actually over comply towards the end. So the other analogy I like to use in this little self deprecating um, is uh, when I took calculus two in college. So I get to the midterm exam and let's just assume I didn't do well on the midterm exam. All right. For argument's sake. I realized, well, I couldn't do calculus, I could do averages, and I realized I'm going to have to get like 120% on the final exam, right? That's impossible, so I did, so, so maybe, maybe I better drop the class. Well, EPA is sort of telling us, you got to ace that midterm exam, otherwise you're never going to be able to make it up in the, in the final exam. And so this is what we've really focused on in our comments, and I, I've been told EPA has heard this loudly and clearly and that there are going to be changes here, but I'm going to keep driving at home until we see that final rule because this is really very concerning to us. When you start looking at when final pr plans are approved and the amount of time you'd have to 2020, there's just no way that you'd be able to uh, adjust for resources there. So uh, in final conclusion, I just you know, want to kind of piece this all together and, and point out that Manitoba Hydro and, and, and the resources that they have provide great benefits to the MISO footprint uh, as it exists today, just given the amount of of wind that we've put on our system and the amount of, of interaction we have with them. Um, and I think this is going to be even more true as we look at the clean power plan. And while we don't have a position on this particular issue of counting uh, Canadian hydro, it cannot be denied that it will be an important resource uh, for our, as our generation portfolio changes and we fully expect it to, uh, to do so. Uh, the other piece I did want to just kind of drive home is the importance of regional solutions to the clean power plan. If we implement this in a way that takes out the, the economic dispatch that we engage in today, those, those big bars of billions of dollars of benefits that we get today are going to go away, and the operational benefits that we get from having a big footprint are going to go away. And so we really need to, to think about that and encourage interactions among our states and, and look at regional solutions because it does provide significant economic benefits. So with that, I'll turn it over to Derek and we'll look forward to questions and discussion. Thanks. Go for it. Thanks, everyone. Uh, really appreciate the invitation today, uh, Wilson Center, uh, for hosting this. And uh, I've long felt that the interconnections, electric interconnections between the U.S. and Canada deserve more attention, especially here in D.C. in these policy debates. So it's great to have this dialogue. I also um, was reminded by some of the pictures uh, put up before of just some great personal experiences for me. My wife, Allie, and I uh, canoed the Rupert River for our um, uh, honeymoon um, way up in northern Quebec and uh, your final picture David really reminded me of that experience um, just gorgeous northern rivers that I, you know I think if people haven't experienced it's, it's a good goal um, I must admit when we were out there for two weeks not seeing a single person um, the Hydro Quebec helicopters occasionally going, going overhead gave me a little bit of uh, comfort but um, <laughs> So I, I'm going to really step back here and uh, talk about the Clean Power Plan and um, Canadian Hydro from a much kind of higher level. Um, I, but first I want to say uh, thank you to Manitoba Hydro, Minnesota Power, and MISO for just participating in this dialogue. I think this kind of dialogue is essential to uh, EPA and the states and all of us stakeholders getting this right. Um, Clean Power Plan is obviously new. Uh, it's great that people are rolling up their sleeves and thinking about how do we make it work? What are the resources? What are the policy options? Um, so I, I really appreciate that. I'm quickly going to run through um, 
NRDC's kind of high-level reaction to the clean power plan. I thought that might be helpful for folks to hear. Um, have a quick comment on Canadian Hydro. Um, but then I want to spend some time um, talking about the, uh, the electric grid, which is obviously uh, across the state boundaries, international, as, and as, as has, has been discussed. Um, and we're thinking about both interstate issues and international issues, and I think there are a lot of similarities um, with, the, with the policy questions and concerns we have uh, across these borders. And um, then I want to make a couple of specific policy recommendations um, that, that uh, many of which were teed up by the C2ES presentation um, at the end. So in, in terms of NRDC's reaction to the Clean Power Plan, um, you know, climate change and clean energy are really the Natural Resources Defense Council's top priority. Um, you know, we're a big environmental nonprofit. Um, we have uh, about a million and a half members that are focused on uh, improving uh, environmental outcomes. Climate change is our top priority. Um, and I think it's really the central environmental challenge of our time. So the Clean Power Plan takes this challenge on for the electric sector, uh, the, the biggest source of emissions in the U.S. Um, and we think it stands on strong footings. Um, that being said, we actually think there are ways that this good plan could be made better. Um, and, um, and some of those things are not inconsistent with the, some of the presentation that's been made already. Um, we think about making a good plan better in, in two ways. Um, one is on strength and the other is on consistency. Um, so just at a high level. And in terms of strength of the proposal, we think especially in the later years the proposal is not strong enough. Um, you know, we think that the trajectory that the proposal puts us not on is not the, the right long-term trajectory. So there obviously are some concerns about the near-term targets, but if you think about where we need to go long-term, we need to be on about a kind of 2 percent per year reduction pathway, and the, the proposal does not get us on that trajectory. Um, in terms of consistency, um, we think of consistency in two ways. Um, consistency, consistency across the building blocks. So if folks are familiar with the proposal, it has these kind of assumptions for different resource types and building blocks. And um, we think that, that resources should be evaluated consistently both in target setting and compliance. Um, so for instance, the evaluation of new natural gas, uh, you know, that should be uh, a, a part of the target setting and also part of compliance. Um, we also think the same is true for not emitting resources where we should have consistency between target setting and compliance. So we'd like to see some changes made in that area. Um, we'd also like to see increased consistency across states. Um, uh, the targets are quite different across states. Uh, we think that there's a real opportunity, especially for the coal intensive states that didn't get very strong targets, um, to do more and uh, to try to bring that kind of level of stringency and, and consistency together across the state targets. Um, so on the consistency front, we look at EPA's authority as being limited to um, reducing emissions of CO2 from existing power plants, and, and we really take a technology neutral uh, approach to this, um, both in terms of policy development and then thinking about compliance. And so we think that um, all non or low emitting resources that can be shown to offset generation from existing fossil units should qualify. But I think the key is that you've, you've really, you know, this is a regulation that's supposed to reduce emissions from existing fossil plants. So you've got to, you've got to have that connection to show that you're really backing down those, those resources and those emissions. Um, so we think the full system should be evaluated. This includes energy efficiency, renewables, including hydro, um, and all other resources. And in the case of hydro, as, as I said, as long as the new, as the, uh, as, as long as it's newer incremental and backs out existing fossil, we, we don't see a barrier to it participating and um, delivering benefits. Um, that being said, we do think this issue of kind of gaming and environmental leakage is one we have to focus on. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll spend some more time on that. But we think there are real opportunities, essentially, for these non-emitting resources to become more competitive in the market. And, um, you know, if we have a price on carbon, we should see the non-emitting resources begin to outcompete the, the high-emitting resources. So on the Canadian hydro front, um, you know, some of you may be aware the, uh, the NRDC has spent some time working on Canadian hydro issues with, the, with some First Nations, and I think it's fair to say with Manitoba Hydro that we haven't always been on the same page. Um, and um, 
uh, you know, we, we look forward to continuing the dialogue with folks. Um, and just, to, just wanted to mention that, you know, the carbon piece is obviously incredibly important in our focus right now. Um, but it's not the only environmental issue of concern. Uh, I think folks did a nice job kind of flagging some of the other issues um, in terms of the impacts on, on waterways and habitat. Um, and we need to just be sure that projects are properly developed and implemented and evaluated over time, including, you know, consultation with First Nations and, and other stakeholders. Um, I think, you know, NRDC's approach to um, project development and, and new technologies, I, I kind of characterize it as do it right. Um, you know, we don't, we don't want to say no to a lot of different things, but we want to make sure that, that things are developed properly and, um, you know, we think there are a lot of projects, um, hydro or otherwise, that, that can, can be done right. Um, so I want to turn to um, the environmental integrity of the Clean Power Plan and then some of these border issues. Um, as, as folks have mentioned, we live in an interconnected uh, world, uh, interconnected electric market uh, across the state boundaries, international boundaries. and. Um, you know, sadly, the Clean Air Act and Section 111D are, are not perfectly aligned with that, right? So we've got state-by-state state, uh, plans that are going to be developed uh, for an interconnected uh, electric grid. Um, and we, too, think that there are tremendous opportunities for states and uh, provinces, countries to work together and build a system that recognizes that interconnectivity and, and, and links their policies, develops consistent policies and links them so that, so that we um, avoid some of these seams issues. Um, we also think that EPA can help with this. Um, the proposal in its, in its original form, I think, didn't do enough to kind of facilitate the linkage of, of state plans. Um, and, and we think that there are ways that they can, they can help facilitate that without having to create grand kind of regional plans that everyone signs on to. Um, but, but allow plants to, to link and trade um, in a way that, that kind of allows the markets to stay interconnected. Um, environmental leakage is really our primary concern when we think about interconnected uh, grids and markets and power flows from Canada to the U.S. And I should say that it's, it's really not just Canada, it's, it's as much Mexico. I mean, the, the, the um, power mix be between Mexico and the U.S. is very different. I think we need to get a, a policy framework in place that really works across all, all borders, state and international. Um, and uh, Kyle did a good job of introducing this. Um, and, and I think the, the, the state border issues really are very similar. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about a couple of concerns that are really state to state concerns as much as uh, international concerns. Um, so there was a little bit of introduction to leakage um, before, but I think of it as when a policy framework creates kind of inconsistent or distorted markets or market signals that allow one region's emissions to increase uh, despite another region's uh, being, able to, being held constant or declining. And um, for instance, you could imagine one region capping its emissions with a, with a firm cap and another region going with a, a say, a rate-based approach where it's a pound per megawatt hour approach and emissions could potentially go up if generation increased in that region uh, in comparison to the capped region. Um, you could also imagine this happening between states and provinces. If a state had a, a carbon constraint and a, a cap, say, and the province didn't, uh, you know, worst case, you could imagine new generation cited in the province that would not face that carbon constraint and you'd have that um, loss of environmental, uh, environmental benefit and leakage. Um, you know, we've heard a bunch about Manitoba, and obviously this is kind of an extreme case of having very little fossil left. But, you know, I think the one thing you could imagine is, uh, you know, two peaking plants on either side of the border. Um, and one could face a carbon cost, uh, say it was under a mass-based cap, and the, in Manitoba it might not. And uh, so, you know, that would affect the dispatch potentially of those plants, with the Minnesota plant being at a competitive disadvantage to the Manitoba plant. And it's that kind of... <clears throat> um, dynamic that we really want to avoid. Um, so I, I think there are policy solutions. I think that these, these concerns are definitely solvable. And, um, you know, we, we think that there's a way for uh, imported power from Canada to really to benefit the, the, the system and, and uh, the U.S. Um, 
But we, we do want to see a durable market uh, across the border um, over the long term. And um, you know, clearly, we've got great progress in provinces like British Columbia and Quebec with their strong carbon programs um, that, that I think look much like what might happen in the U.S., you know, whether it's a, a fee-based approach in British Columbia or a cap-and-trade-based approach in Quebec. Um, obviously, Ontario has, has uh, recently announced that they're thinking about joining with Quebec and, and uh, California, which is great. Um, and we think there's an opportunity for all the provinces uh, to implement carbon policies for the electric sector as the states do. Um, uh, you know, that being said, we'd rather see uh, national programs. It would be great for Canada and the U.S. to be working together on a, on a true kind of dialogue, um, which I think we could do better on, and um, have both sides have carbon, carbon policies that, that really, really work. Um, assuming that there isn't um, you know, complete consistency, I do want to run through a couple of specific policy ideas. Um, and I think some of these were flagged by Kyle, but uh, you know, when we think about the Clean Power Plan and compliance and talk to stakeholders and, and companies about what they're thinking about, um, there are really three policy approaches that kind of seem to be rising to the top. Um, one is uh, mass-based cap-and-trade, um, so that sets a fixed tonnage limit. It's really the, the uh, market-based approach that companies are used to. It's been used for a lot of other pollutants. Um, I think the familiarity that folks have with it draws, draws people to it. Um, the other is a rate-based approach, so you'd set a, a pound per megawatt hour standard and um, uh, plants that were uh, emitting above the standard would have to buy credits uh, to meet the standard, so they could buy credits from non- or low-emitting resources like wind or hydro or energy efficiency to meet the standard. And then the third is a fee or tax-based approach. Um, and, uh, you know, in this kind of approach, uh, and this has been discussed in the MISO regions, I think, quite a bit with uh, Great River and Brattle's proposal, um, but there'd be a fixed uh, dollar per ton uh, assessed on, on each uh, uh, ton of generation or ton of emissions associated with fossil generation, and that would change the dispatch of plants in the market and you deliver reduced emissions. Uh, we do have some concerns about that approach just in terms of having to do a true up to make sure you're hitting the targets, so there's some additional complexity there. But um, I think any of these approaches would work. and. Um, really the best way to solve these border issues is to try to get everyone to do as much as possible the same approach. So, you know, if, if the MISO region can come together and, uh, you know, you may not have a regional plan, but everyone says we're going to do mass-based, that's going to make a lot of these concerns go away. Um, if if uh, Manitoba or, or some of the provinces say we're a part of MISO, we're going to do the same, even for the very limited. Uh, plants, fossil plants we have. That would make the, the, the problem go away. Um, and uh, if there isn't that kind of uh, consistency and, and policy fix where everyone's under the same program, you may have to have some, um, some additional requirements. So you could imagine uh, some states going mass-based and some states going rate-based or uh, the states implementing a, a carbon constraint and the provinces not. Uh, you're, you're probably going to have to have some either after-the-fact adjustments, so you could imagine a, a rate-based state uh, having their emissions go up even though their pound per megawatt hour kind of rate went down as they're supplying additional power to the mass-based states. So I think you're going to have to have EPA and the states are going to have to develop some kind of adjustment to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and if, if you had uh, the states uh, importing a lot of power from the provinces and there wasn't a carbon constraint on uh, provincial generation, I think you would have to have some kind of requirement like California has uh, in their system where they say, well, imported power um, needs to essentially hold an allowance for the emissions associated with it as well. So you're kind of capturing the tonnage that might be associated with, with that power. Um, so I think there are solutions. Um, some of them are more complicated than others. Um, I think the, the cleanest one is to try to get, get a region or a market region to do the same approach. Um, I think there's some great dialogue going on in the, in the MISO region today. Um, in fact, really every market region in the country has kind of, a, I think, a very productive, quiet dialogue going on with the exception of PJM, out competing them. Um, but it sounds like uh, there's interest in that uh, coming up. So we're, we're hopeful that these kinds of conversations and the, the participants in the market regions coming together will help solve some of these problems and we won't have 
these seams issues, but that's obviously our, our bigger, biggest concern. Um, so thanks for having us today. Um, again, appreciate the dialogue and uh, look forward to the questions. <laughs>
you know, as we're digging through the clean power plan, we tend to find at least one more issue or question for every one we think we solve, uh, at least. Um, so, yeah, we'll, I'm sure we will come up with more. Great, great. Um, I, I think that a lot of the presentations focused on um, the characteristics of power and generation does have an impact. Uh, you know, how it's generated does have an impact on the characteristics. We talked about the ramping. We talked about the, um, uh, the intermittency of, of some resources. So I, I'm just wondering, I, I think of, um, uh, I think Cole had the, the slogan, coal can do that. So if you're going to write uh, hydro can do that, um, uh, Dave Cormie, w what would it include? And, and Doug, if you want to uh, pitch in on this in terms of the, the characteristics that it provides um, uh, and, and kind of its contribution, both in terms of emission reductions, but also kind of the, the characteristics of, of power markets. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Uh, the which characteristics you you build into the the clean power plan about hydro that you're trying to attract? Yeah. Well, so what does hydro bring to the table in terms of states that are looking to um, uh, satisfy the requirements and put in place a plan to comply with a clean power plan? W what will hydro uh, provide them in terms of uh, achieving uh, that goal? Yeah, I think I think the um, uh, the example we have with Minnesota Power where their investment in wind resources is uh, it, it, it's, it's an easier uh, sell to do that when you have uh, the hydro storage available so it reduces the cost of, of that in, of that investment and so you know the, 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 the storage uh, uh, services that, that we can provide um, make there's a there's a leveraging there mm -hmm. and uh, I think in New York, uh, I think I was reading, it's, you know, you don't need a lot of megawatts in order to integrate large-scale wind. And, and, you know, our, 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 our bidirectional ear now is plus or minus 500 megawatts. And that will enable um, a, a huge amount of additional wind to be brought in to the grid with, uh, without affecting uh, grid stability and, and reliability. And um, so, you know, we, would, we, we need to value that so that um, as, as as w as wind and, and other renewables are developed in the U.S., that that if, if Canada can provide those services, there's an incentive for for uh, for that for those services to be bought, and that and that synergies will be those synergies will be captured. So unless the purchasing utility finds it doesn't see value in that, there's no reason for them to come to Manitoba Hydro or Quebec Hydro or BC Hydro and buy those services. There needs to be some there needs to be some recognition of that value. Great. Is there any other Questions from others on the panel to fellow panel panelists. If not, we'll go. I'll yeah, go ahead with that one. Yeah. yeah, I just wonder what people think. We've been hearing a lot on the rate base versus mass base, and Derek and Kyle, maybe this is for you. Um, of certain characteristics of it that rate base allows effectively for infinite load growth. So why wouldn't I select a, a rate base versus a mass base, which is going to, you know, impact my load if I have load growth and I need to add. Uh, generation to meet that. Obviously, in our mass-based system, I'm going to be more constrained. Whereas, if I add the right generation under the rate base, I can just keep growing and growing. I've thought of this as you got to kind of have a an equation that equates the two to some extent, so you don't you don't impact one negatively versus versus low growth. You don't want to be anti uh, economy growing. Are are you guys hearing? Are you thinking about this? Of how do you answer that question to people when they're thinking about the rate-based versus mass-based uh, approach for their states? So just to take a quick stab, um, I agree with the, the concern, um, and, and I'm hearing that from a number, number of folks. Um, uh, I think it's important for folks to recognize, though, that EPA and its kind of preliminary proposal on rate-to-mass conversion uh, there were two approaches um, that they laid out. One was uh, an approach where the state essentially was was putting a mass-based uh, constraint on just the existing generation. Um, so new, say, new gas or new fossil plants would not be covered by the cap. Um, you know, if if that's the case, I think there is actually quite a lot, quite a bit of room to expand plants and emissions um, if you don't include new plants in the the state program. 
Um, they also laid out an approach where you, you do uh, essentially cap uh, both existing and new plants, um, and then, then there's a, a kind of a growth factor, load growth factor, and, and uh, conversion methodology to go from a rate standard to a mass standard incorporating load growth. Um, we have some concerns in the weeds about the way they've done that, but um, I, you know, I think there, there is a way to go from rate to mass and still uh, address the load growth concern. I'd also like to point out that with uh, in a rate standard, the rule would likely function very differently uh, depending on if your state has a target above or below that of a natural gas com combined cycle plant, which is likely your marginal generator. So, I mean, in a state like California, which has a target of something in the 500 pounds per megawatt hour, I think, um, you know, there's, they're not going to have infinite growth because adding a natural gas combined cycle plant would push you above your rate. But again, if, it's, if that's not included in the rate anyway, um, Derek's right, that makes a difference. Um, but of course, there are a number of states uh, that are currently coal heavy that could just add gas and, and their rate would uh, be in compliance. Um, coal but, heavy and, the, and, and their target is above the yeah, natural gas combined cycle. Right. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, uh, infinite growth isn't happening now in the absence of clean power plant. It's not likely to start once the clean power plant is in place. Uh, so, you know, states won't have an incentive to just keep adding fossil generation with no purpose. Um, the real concern, is, as Derek brought up, is if a rate-based state is selling power into a, a mass-based state where the mass-based state isn't accounting for it. Um, that's the that's the key issue. Um. Great. So um, I don't, Andrew, maybe you could let me know, do people, oh, you do have a microphone. Okay, so Andrew Finn, our host, and we have two microphones here. Uh, just ask for it. Uh, give your name and affiliation and, and uh, in your question. I didn't want to be first, but I guess I'll, <laughs> I'll go ahead. Um, I'm Annalie Grant from SNL Energy. Um, I'm wondering if you can, uh, perhaps David McMillan and David Cormy can speak to this. Can you talk about some of the permitting and policy challenges of siting a transmission line across the Canada-US border? Um, are there any policy changes you can suggest that might mitigate delays and um, perhaps encourage more interconnections? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll start with that. Um, in, in Canada, we, um, we go through a route selection process where the proponent actually ultimately through uh, uh, stakeholder engagements finally chooses the route. And we, we come to the border with this is where the, this is, there is only going to be one border crossing and there's only one, uh, one, uh, one transmission route. And that is the route that then gets subject to the environmental review process. Um, in Minnesota, it's, I think it's a little different, and Dave can correct me on this, but you, the proponent needs to bring forward three possible uh, um, routes, and, the, and then, and then, the, and the, the authority then chooses which, which one is, 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 uh, um, is going to be selected. And that creates a problem at the border, because on the Canadian side, we only have one border crossing, and on the Minnesota side, there's three. And so the question is, how do you resolve that issue? And, uh, um, and that's, you know, that's something that we're dealing with right now. Um, from the from Minnesota's perspective, there aren't three border crossings. There's only one because the because those other two aren't going to line up with our transmission line, and, and we're not going to string a a, a, um, a a cable between the two of them to make it to make it work. It's not going it, it to it has to be done early, and so there is that issue of coordinating uh, um, the, the route selection process, and. Um, no, I'm not sure. We, it hasn't. Has, I don't think it's come to the point where it's caused a difficulty. It's just you know we our processes are different, and and it would be b better uh, and and reduce the risk if we had had, had consistency in in in, in how, uh, how how routes are selected in the in the two two, two countries. I'll just add a little uh, a little added flavor there. We. I would say the biggest thing we've done from our perspective, and it is going very well, as I tried to suggest in my. Uh, my remarks is extensive and deep engagement with the communities along the whole corridor, which includes a couple of uh, possible routes. 
and we got out way, way, way ahead shortly after we inked the uh, first 250 megawatt deal with, with Manitoba Hydro to begin working politically and at all levels with, uh, with stakeholders about the rationale for the line and some of the benefits we've talked about today. So that's been the most significant local piece to help us with. And then DOE has been very, very good in terms of uh, looking at that, saying, hey, you did the right thing with stakeholders early, and uh, we want to use that project as, uh, as an example of how we can potentially steer the federal side. And now we're into, I think the Corps of Engineers is in there, maybe EPA is not going to be now, which would be okay, and then we've got uh, the Forest Service and then the state entities. U.S. Fish and Wildlife as well. So EPA is playing a very helpful role with us on this side of the border in terms of how does that EIS process get built in in a tandem way with the state. So it's a joint state-federal matter, but DOE has been very helpful from our perspective in the line. I don't have anything to add to David's comments about the crossing other than don't want to alarm anybody. I think it is going well, and we will get one spot, and we will match up. So that's... Uh, the process, as David would say, needs to work. <laughs> and when we're done with the process, we'll use Lake Winnipeg as a battery, eh? <laughs> That's what I've learned working with my friend here. So, yeah, Just one last comment on that, and I, I, I think it has to do with um, before the uh, regulatory process start, get out there early. And so that when you actually put that advertisement in the newspaper and saying you're the, the regulatory process, this, it, that's, that should not be a surprise to anybody. And, and I have to compliment uh, Minnesota Power on how early and effectively they've engaged with all the, the interests along, uh, along in the corridor so that, uh, um, you know, it surprised, it surprised everyone how, how uh, the, the process has worked and, and there's been no, much fewer risks, you know, we, we think of will this line ever get built and building transmission has never been easy. But uh, this is a, is, a, is, a, is a perfect example of how to do it right, I think, in Minnesota. Um, thank you. I found this to be very, very helpful. I'm uh, Rebecca Blood. I'm from a firm called Wexler Walker here in D.C., but I'm here representing the National Hydropower Association. Our key leaders are tied up with their annual conference, which I think many of you have attended in the last couple of days. On the Clean Power Plan, I'm curious to know what uh, responses you have gotten back from the states that would directly benefit from the availability of imported Canadian hydro to achieve their clean power plans. We're curious to um, as well work with mm -hmm. our state decision makers to uh, make sure they understand that hydropower should be a counted resource toward compliance. Curious to know what your efforts have been and what the replies have been so far. Kyle, I know as part of the report we, we did do a um, comment tracking uh, exercise and if you could mention that and, and certainly the people, uh, other people, uh, please chime in as well. Yeah, so we, we haven't brought the report to the attention of, of the state policymakers uh, yet since it was just released, but we will be starting that process very soon. Um, and But we do have a pretty good sense, of, as Jeff mentioned, of what the state thoughts are on Canadian hydropower from their comments. Um, I don't remember which slide deck it was in that showed all of the uh, state agencies that spoke very favorably about um, Canadian hydropower. I know the New York ISO was was a big one. Most of the Midwestern states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, that we've been talking about, all you know, questioned why Canadian you know new resources in Canada should be treated differently from new resources in uh, another state. They all pointed to the reliability benefits, the uh, backing up of wind benefits that we've been talking about throughout the the session. So you know, it's a it's a pretty safe bet that any state that currently does import hydropower or has the potential to import hydropower from Canada uh, would want it to to qualify in, in their um, implementation schemes for the Clean Power Plan. I'll uh, just give a flavor of Minnesota at some peril here in terms of uh, trying to predict anything that might be happening in a session that's uh, careening towards a late May end, I think. but. You're right, Kyle, that uh, intuitively I think most state-level policymakers want to see 
more options and uh, bigger resources like this brought to bear. But there's a lot of local issues in a place like St. Paul, and we're at 25 percent now by 2025. I think uh, I know my friends from Excel are here too. They're at 2030 by 2020, or they're at 30 percent by 2020. And there's a lot of talk every session about should 25 or 30 be 40. And uh, again, keeping economics and uh, reliability in mind, we'd be okay with the rise, but we got to make sure that we count an 11 percent bump that we're investing heavily in now, that you wouldn't raise that without counting it. And then there's folks that would say, well, then it probably should be 50. And that's where that debate I don't want to say mired down it, but that's that's the kind of conversation going on in a state house like the one in St. Paul. I would guess it's similar in other places too. What's the right number? What's the right long-term number? And if we're going to count big incremental lumpy resources, some of which already exist too in a place like Minnesota, there's a lot of um, Canadian hydropower already imported. You know, we think again it should all count. And uh, I think to uh, to uh, Derek's point that. As long as we're working to offset carbon-based uh, or you know emissions coming from fossil fuel, why wouldn't we count it all? But getting through the details and through the history and uh, through the politics around what should the new number be for a mandate is a little more complicated than uh, than one might think. David, could I just uh, f uh, follow up and uh, on? Your discussions in Minnesota, you mentioned a price on carbon today, you've mentioned it before. How do those discussions uh, play out in in Minnesota? Are there others saying it uh, in terms of implementation? I'm sure, you know, Brian, if he's managing uh, wholesale markets, a price associated with the carbon attached to the generation uh, would fit right in there. I is anybody looking at, 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 uh, at pricing carbon in Minnesota? There's, there's talk. There hasn't been uh, detailed legislation proposed that way. We, of course, would never want to see something that wasn't at a minimum implemented regionally and much more preferably implemented at the federal level. I don't think, and maybe I should do one of these, throw some money to the charity bet if I get it wrong, but if there's three st adjoining states that are less politically aligned than North Dakota, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, I would love to hear where they are. So. Um, with that in mind, yeah, there's talk, Jeff, but uh, I think for the moment, well, I mean, Minnesota's suing North Dakota right now for over coal-based imports, and that's somewhere between district court and uh, federal circuit court. And I, I wouldn't want to encourage that conversation as much as we think long-term environmental policy demands a price on carbon. I wouldn't want to see Minnesota act because it would just be punitive in terms of the businesses in the state that are competing across the Red River and uh, across the St. Croix River to our uh, west and east, respectively. You know, one of the, uh, the significant um, um, issues with developing large hydro is a long lead time. Um, a, a plant like Conawapa that I mentioned, uh, you know, will take about 10 years to build. It'll take us uh, five or six years to get through the environmental and regulatory process and in building our relations with the Aboriginal community. So these, you know, if you're gonna, if you're, if you're thinking about 2030 as the end game, it, it's almost getting too late to think about bringing Kahnawapi in service to, to achieve that. But if you're thinking longer term, like what are you gonna do after 2030? Is it 2035 or 2040 when, you know, a large hydro plant uh, can make a difference? Um, we think that, 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 you know, a long-term indication with regard to uh, carbon pricing would, would, would help in, in making us, allow us to make those early investment decisions because if you're just thinking about 2030, we're running, we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, even with, even being 15 years away, 15 years is not a long time when you're building new, new large hydro. So, there may be a cliff at 2030. Like, what do you do after that? And, well, we're not even thinking about that. Well, you better think about that if, if, if you're relying on hydro in the long run to be, help, to be part of the solution. 2030 is, 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 is coming quickly. That's fantastic. Uh, the, uh, we, we still have a time for a couple more questions. Um, 
Uh, thank you. Tim Downey, I work at the St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation, small federal agency within the U.S. Department of Transportation. Number one, uh, fantastic panel. Uh, everyone did a great job. But I have one issue that uh, I really feel a little bit ill at ease about. First of all, I want to uh, say that I am totally in favor of hydropower. I hope it uh, expands uh, greatly and also all, I'm very much in favor of wind power. But the one thing that I find troubling, I guess, as I look at the problems for the country, America, and for that matter, uh, uh, Canada and other countries, is the replacement for coal. And I understand, really, that's what we're talking about here. Everyone would like to cut greenhouse gases down to zero, but the old uh, line of perfection is the enemy of the good, It to me, is right at the heart of this. We in this country have uh, a gift, and that gift is gas. And, uh, you know, the Department of Energy has recently been putting out uh, uh, stats indicating that we're number one in the world for gas. I realize that's part of the fossil uh, problem, but I also realize as we look around the room, big problems aren't solved in five and ten year increments. Uh, those of us who are past the age of 50 know how fast a decade goes. And so if you're looking at this issue, it's really realistically not going to be solved in less than, in the most optimistic scenario, a generation and probably 50 years out. So my question is uh, from whoever on the panel may wish to discuss, uh, say a few comments on that, where does gas fit in this, especially given, for example, in the seaways, the Midwest, the manufacturing center of this country, the tens and tens of thousands of jobs that people have that are associated with coal, are they going to be picked up uh, by uh, hydropower generated electric uh, electricity formed by uh, hydropower and wind power, solar power, biomass, geothermal, or is it not more realistic to say it's unfortunate, but we have to include that gas factor as part of the equation. Thank you. Take that. Um, so obviously, we have spent a lot of time talking about hydro today. Um, you know, we feel pretty strongly that we need to come up with uh, market-based approaches that work for all technologies um, and, and send the right price signals so that we, uh, we really drive down emissions. Um, you know, th those policies won't um, necessarily deliver all the resources we need, though. Um, you know, there are significant market barriers to energy efficiency. We have to get the utility business model right so that they're <coughs> supportive of energy efficiency. Um, we are, we're quite worried about a, a big lock-in of, of a lot of new natural gas. Um, if you look at the long-term trajectory we need to get on, uh, you know, we, we probably are going to have to sequester CO2 from gas um, to, to if we lock in a lot of gas. So I think it's really important that we look at all resource types, um, you know, depending on the region and, and the resources available, different things will predominate. But, um, uh, you know, we think we've got to look at, look at everything and, and uh, really focus, uh, especially our kind of R&D dollars and, and say, say potentially revenue from auctions uh, of allowances or something like that towards, towards those things that we need long term, which are non emitting. I'll just point out in our phase one and phase two study that we've done, which was essentially a capacity expansion of what capacity would be added on to the system to meet reliability requirements or at least resource adequacy requirements um, in this time frame, there was an enormous addition of gas into the MISO footprint. I, well, I should be careful. There was an addition of gas uh, into the MISO footprint. It was significant. And a lot of that was actually based on our view of the, the interplay between 111B as in boy and 111D as in dog. You know, thank goodness they made those sound exactly the same so we can't actually have a conversation about them. But um, when you look at that, if you're adding and you're, and you're uh, applying the 111B rule and you're compliant with that, as, as Derek pointed out, 
you can actually kind of remove that generator from the 111D requirements uh, as the interplay between the two. So it doesn't, you can serve load using that generator because it's a complying under 111B and it's not counting into your calculation. So there was a pretty significant amount of gas added. Now, that might get changed. That might get looked at uh, in the final 111D rule and try and, and look at what those interactions are. And then we'll have to, to relook at that. But gas plays a pretty significant uh, part of the capacity expansion, at least that we've modeled so far uh, with respect to the draft rule. All right. Well, with that, uh, we run out of our, <laughs> of our time. I want to thank the Wilson Center and the Canada Institute for hosting um, this uh, this panel, uh, and let's keep the conversation going. Uh, outside, there are copies of the paper and the infographic from C2ES. If they're gone, uh, just contact us, and and we'll direct you to the resources. Thanks to the panelists, and thanks to you all for coming.